Steve, you've got to be. You know, he's one of the. Don't, don't, one don't, of the don't, biggest don't, don't, don't. Nashville no. tracking mixing engineers. Oh, yeah. Story history. <laughs> He's such a you know Legend. you are he's such a sweet guy that the first time you meet him you're all you feel like oh we should start a session like right now because I want <laughs> I, w- I want you in the room. Yeah. So you know, what part of what I want these guys to see? You, am I on, buddy? Check one two, Brian. Check one two. Do you hear part me? Of, part of what I want them to see, quite honestly, is like just people's I'm vibe. Getting, I'm getting some delay. Is it? Did you check your? Uh... Oh, it's better. Got it. Uh, sorry. So, I'm sorry. I, I'm serious now. Go ahead. So, what I want them to see partially is just people's vibe. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because yeah. when I was coming up, I, I was really surprised by whenever I got to work with guys I considered to be idols of mine, like Phil Ramone, and be in the room and see those guys doing their thing. I was like, oh, wow. Yeah. I'm going to, like, I'm going to steal his vibe until I have a vibe. You know, I'm just going right. to walk like a duck until I feel like I'm a duck. Right. And I, I learned like the dynamic, how you treat clients, how you talk to artists, how you talk to studio personnel, how you deal with the people from the record company. I learned a lot of that by just aping it from other people until I felt comfortable doing it. And it's funny because if they see that you're that kind of, if they feel that coming from you, then they get a little bit easier with you. And it's like, they go, oh, this guy knows. He's a- so what am I here for then? I mean, that's exactly, you know, I, I guess I can now. go now. <laughs> well, let's no, you know what? That You hit the nail. Na- I mean... If you guys get anything out of this evening, that is exactly, you know, they don't teach that in school. You can't teach that. You learn that on the job, and that's the way I came up. I came up on the job. And so I don't tell know. us, New okay, York well, City, you, I mean, New Jersey. So I, I, I was born and raised in New Jersey, in Elizabeth, New Jersey, which, you know, if you've ever flown it to Newark Airport, Newark Airport is half in Elizabeth. That's where Elizabeth is. I used to be able to see the World Trade Center from my neighborhood. And The Sopranos was mostly written about my neighborhood. So that's, the, that's where I come from. Um, but I lived in a house with my aunt and uncle, Aunt Mary, Uncle Joe. I'm Italian, and we all have Aunt Mary's and Uncle Joe. They had two sons, Joey and Anthony, uh, who were much older than us. Me and my two brothers, John and Henry, I was the youngest one. So we all grew up in this big house. They were at least 20 years old as us. So they grew up like during the 40s and 50s, and they were musicians. So I was... And my grandfather came from Italy, and he was a musician. So I had music in my house constantly, at, from whenever I can remember. And of course, it was all AM radio, mono. Um, and my cousin, both of them, Joey uh, and Buzzy, Anthony was Buzzy. He, Buzzy was the drummer, and Joey was the bass player, left-handed. In 63, 64, he got a call to audition for a famous pop band at the time, and he won the audition. He became the bass player for the Four Seasons. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm assuming you all know who they are, right? Yeah. Because it's funny because, you know, when, when you're talking to younger kids, and when I say kids, you know, anywhere from 16 to like 30, some of them don't know. I, you'd be surprised. So I'll turn to someone and say, well, it's like Layla. You know, like in Layla? And no, they don't know Layla. And you can't assume that everybody in music knows the history before the 90s because the 90s are kind of like, um, uh, what do you call, uh, old rock to some people. Um, yeah, uh, classic. Classic rock, yeah. So anyway, getting back to my situation, make a long story short, you know, I grew up, my, my brothers played music and I listened to them rehearse in my basement. I tried to play acoustic when I was a kid, I couldn't grasp it. But when I grew up as a kid, I would listen on the radio and, and it was AM, so it was mono and it was a little transistor radio. And uh, the DJ, even the sound of the DJs, they had reverb on them back in the day. Mm-hmm. Even that coming through this little speaker and then of course a lot of Motown, I would hear these sounds and I was attracted to the sound, not necessarily the song, okay? Yeah. Um, And I envisioned in my brain, it was like, someone played that, you know, and I tried to think how they did it. And then I started buying records, recorded by, recorded at, and I said, I want to be that recorded by guy. I want to, you know, and I remember seeing record plant on a number of records and my cousin, and then I was a junior in high school, I took a course in New York for 10 weeks from the Recording Institute of America, which was totally bogus because I was a kid, I knew nothing about music and these people were either musicians or technical type people. So Tony May was my instructor. Do you know who Tony mm-hmm. May is? Or I don't was think so. a really cool engineer. Anyway, 
I took that course and I knew I couldn't be in the business and I went, I, I graduated high school and I started working at General Motors and then one day my cousin said, hey Steve, I was talking on the phone with an old friend of mine, Roy Sakala, and I said, I've seen that name before on albums. Roy Sakala, I, I, who is he? See, oh, he owns the record plant. The record plant, I've seen right. that album before. On a, so all of a sudden I got, Joe, can you, can you, and Joey, you know, he, I was like his son to him, you know, he did anything for me. So he hooked me up with Roy Sakala, who owned the record plant studios, which in 1978, it was one of the hottest rock studios in the country. Uh, John Lennon did all of his solo projects there, and Roy did everything for John Lennon. So a much longer story short, I got hired at the record plant in 1978. As a general assistant. As, yeah, they, used to, they used to call us uh, librarians or generals because we did all general duties. So, so you weren't necessarily on sessions at that point, you were just sort of getting no, ready? No, no, but here's the deal. It was May of 78 and General Motors, when, when they make the cars in the factories for the new years, for the new models, they lay off the staff and they retool because some of the parts are shaped differently, so they have to fix the lines. So in 87 for 88 that year, they were gonna change the cars a lot, so we had off from May to September. I was 21 years old, and I was making, you know, I was getting paid for the time off. I was getting unemployment, but it was like 95% of my pay. So I'm thinking to myself, I'm gonna have an amazing summer. I'm gonna go down the shore, Jersey Shore, every week. And I, get, I had to show up twice a month for my check. That's when I got my in at, at Record Plant, and I was there every day. So Record Plant was where? What street? 44th and 8th. 44th and 8th, on west side so of New York Come in through the Hell's Lincoln Kitchen. Tunnel in Hell's Kitchen, about eight blocks from where that other bomb was filmed today. Oh, wow. Yeah, in New York City, if you guys don't know, the, sort of ever in Hell's Kitchen there, you had, well, you had a lot of studios back in the day, but the big famous ones were Sony Studios, Hit Factory, Avatar. Uh, Master Disc was over there on 45th Street. That's right, they were all in Hell's Kitchen. There That's was right. a ton of really epic rooms. And then, of course, you had yeah. Right Track over on 48th, yeah. just east of Times Square. Yeah. Uh, and Unique was there, yeah. and there's, there was a ton of rooms there. And then you had rooms that were just sort of, you had bizarre rooms just sprinkled around in some downtown. Do you remember Sorcerer Sound? No. Oh, that and was And you know, the funny place. thing is, the funny thing is, is that I was at the record plant from 78 till 86. I might have seen the inside of two other studios. Wow. I was on staff at the record That's plant. really we all had unusual staff in New York City right. in that era. Well, you the were... thing is that everyone worked in the studio, so like, when I first started working there, Dave Thoner was uh, staff, but he was out wow. of the country. Jay Messina was out of the country. Shelly Yakis was out of the state. So you said so, that you, you were like, oh, I can't do this when you went to the recording school. What made you right. think you could do it whenever you turned 21? Well, I just wanted to see the studio. So you figured you'd take a shot. I just, yeah, I just wanted to get in. Willing, you know, I wanted to go in there and... You were you know, willing to maybe fail, so you exactly. went Exactly. I had no well, idea. You had to lose. You had the time off. Exactly. But so he, you, when you got in there, I don't want to step on you, but no, no, when you no. got in there, what was, when did you realize, oh, wait a minute, I think I might be able to do this? Uh, when I walked through the door. <laughs> really? You know, it was almost like I hate to compare anything to drugs. And I, I you know, I'm not going to say whether or not. I mean, I can't imagine doing a drug and getting addicted to it like that, but there are certain drugs that you do that with, or there's certain things that you do that with. But for me, when I walked through there, it, I, looking back at it now, it was like a drug, like someone just said, it just took me in there. Wow. So and, you, did you find the confidence then? I guess it was oh, just like, yeah, this is going to happen. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, when, to begin, when you began this, this evening, what was the first thing he had talked about before? Do you remember what he was talking about? Oh, just copying. The vibe, and the, the, vibe the personality, the attitude. That's what I learned there. And there was one person in particular who taught me how to be cool. I mean, I was cool already. I still am, obviously. <laughs> no, but, you know, I, I, I'm not a musician. So I don't understand, like when someone says play an E chord, I, I don't get that. I go by ears, and you can't do that nowadays anymore. But back in the day, that's all we did was we engineer, we got sounds. But now an engineer is more like either the record, the writer, the producer, whatever. Um, so I just got by on, on my sound and my feel and my vibe. So, you know, I can never explain technically what everything does, but I know what it does. So my person, I think in, in, in the role that we do, that, that we play, I think it's 50-50. You know, like, I don't think a producer wants to hang with a real uptight 
engineer who all he thinks about is getting really good sounds and it'll take his time doing it. They want to be with someone that's really loose and nowadays really fast. And so tell me, how do you, let's say when you're in a Nashville session, and I don't know, you probably don't do demos much, but when you're running and you're getting five songs. I do demos songs, all the time. Let's say you do five songs for three yep. hours. How, when they say, hey, punch me in on the two quarter, you just like, how do you know that? Okay, well, it, well, here's the thing. First of all, I don't, nowadays, <laughs> I don't have to run Pro Tools because uh, I, I remember first getting into Pro Tools and running it, I thought to myself, how could you not, as an engineer, want to take care of Pro Tools? That's part of the gig. But now it's to the point now, I don't know if, how often you do sessions outside in studios. Not, not often. Well, you're always going to get a Class A second engineer who knows how to run Pro Tools because I will be the first to admit that I'm not real savvy in Pro Tools. And when you're sitting there and, and the producer says, let's add a couple bars in that solo. I mean, do you all know how to do that right now, re really quickly? Because there are guys that will do that in 30 seconds. Oh, do you yeah. know how to do that? Uh, well, yeah, I've been doing okay. it since. All right, yeah. Idea. So, you know, like, <laughs> I, I'm still old school in the yeah. sense that, yeah, I can do that, but I get it. it might be here's, like, here's okay, what I add number to, you know. Here's what thing. I love about that is, like, sometimes I find in myself, like, even talking to him, like, I used to force myself to do things that I wasn't necessarily, wasn't my thing. Because I felt right. compelled to do it. Right. I felt obliged to do it because other people were doing it. And sometimes it's good to just say, hey, I'm going to find a way to do what I do really great and then surround myself with people that do the other stuff so that it's like a super version rather than you doing 70% on the Pro Tools edit thing. Exactly. Right? And as so, a matter of fact, I, uh, the, the... And you're in a position you could do that. Not a lot of people are, yeah. are working in, you know, for Dan Huff and big records and big right. studios with great assistants. Right. That's a, you know, outside of Nashville, that's a real rare bird now. Is it really? Oh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You've been, you're right. Your, you've been yeah, back yeah. to New York City oh, yeah, to no, see the I, studios I, yeah. we used to work yeah, in? Yeah, I know. You I see, know. I, when I was in New York City, I was in a different studio almost every day. Oh, wow. I wow. had a couple rooms that I was stationed oh, at. But I used to sleep at the studio. Many, many nights I slept. So at the tell studio. me, okay, you, we're, let's go. We're so ahead. getting so back to when I first got in, here's the thing that with me, and you know, I'm not afraid to admit it. And I even tell my kids, and my kids, God bless them, I love them to death. They have a great work ethic. They don't want either my wife and I to ever help them get a job or do that. And that's all I want to do. My son <laughs> wants to work in a hotel downtown. I know people involved. And I'll be damned if I'm not going to help them. So a lot of times you've heard the expression, it's not what you know, it's who you know. So I got a job there at the studio because I knew the owner. He knew my cousin. Right. And on top of that, um, I, 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 I hate this to sound any which way, but... The fact that he was Italian, <laughs> and he, he knew I was Italian, he took to me like a son. So therefore, I, they called me Roy's boy. So I mm -hmm. therefore became his like personal assistant. Yeah. So I was in sessions immediately. But on the other hand, the manager of the studio knew that I was his employee. And he was like, so he treated me like you know, he wasn't, he didn't care if I was in a session with Roy for three hours. Okay, I'm done with that. All right, Steve, go clean the buckets out, you know? So yeah. I had to ride that line between being the teacher's pet and getting along with everyone else. And that's where I worked really hard at doing. I you bet. know what I mean? Because I, I you know, what I did, and, and I don't see it happening anymore, is when I was done with Roy, in some cases it was five, six o'clock, I hung out in the lounge. I just waited. Yeah. Hey, Steve, what are you doing? Can you run and get us this? Oh, absolutely. And I ran, I got him, whatever. Here you go. What are you doing? Nothing. Hang out. And that's how I got started. That's exactly how I got started. And I tell, you know, I, I help out at Blackberry once in a while, but I, I, and I tell them, and as a matter of fact, one kid has a job there because he did this so well. I said, if you're going on a run for food, make sure you get everything right. Yeah. And when you bring it back, this kid yeah, at Blackbird, he so was true. so enthused. He came back. I got it, Steve. And his enthusiasm, because... The thing is, is that that's just symbolic of what you're going to do later on. Yeah. If you can get an order right and you can bring it back and that's okay, yeah. then when your engineer gives you, hey, check this, do this, set up that, blah, 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 he knows. You know, yeah. you work your way up to that. My rooms were always clean. My pencils were sharpened and I did that's everything. That's the stuff that I notice yes. whenever I go into a place. Yes, yes. I was, when I came down in 2002, Chad Carlson was working the desk mm -hmm. over at, at, what is that room? Sound Emporium. Sound Emporium. Yeah. Chad yeah. Carlson won multiple Grammys. Yeah, and he's producing. And he's fantastic. Writes, yeah. He's yeah. super talented. But that guy worked the desk, and, and he would come in, and then eventually I just said, hey, can we have that guy from the desk? Because he was so good 
Yeah. And he became our assistant. And he worked most of that record because it was like, that's the thing I noticed. Right. It was like, wow, this guy's really got an attention for detail. He's yeah. really on it. Because, you know, if, you want, if you're going to have somebody in the room, you'd rather have somebody on it rather than, you know, you, you, there's that moment where someone says, hey, I need a pen in, as you says, soul. Yeah, Somebody's yeah, sliding really a exactly. pencil into his open yes, door. Yes. That's the kind of thing I remember from sessions <laughs> and, where it's like, whoa, that guy is he's a ninja. And People that take pride in medial tasks for me, Yes. When I see somebody taking pride in a menial task, I think, yeah. that guy's going to be great yeah. at yeah. the big stuff. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know where you, you guys are all at. He told me some of you were doing this or that. But, you know, uh, wherever you go from here, we're not saying, you know, to run for a coffee or whatever that. But whatever, whatever the situation is, just make the best of it, you know, mm -hmm. just be the best. And the other thing, too, is I'm sorry, I interrupted. Did I interrupt you or did you this interrupt is, me? This is an evening with Steve Mark and <laughs> Like, you know, if, you're in a, if someone invites you in a session, I don't know what it's like here, it's probably a lot looser, but if I said, oh yeah, you can hang out with me, that means that you're to stand in that room and not say an effing word to nobody. Right. You know, just, just be a fly on the wall. And even if someone comes off to you and starts a conversation, answer, you know, quickly and retreat. You know, it, it, you never know because maybe a bit, the bass player in the band starts sparking up a conversation and you get kind of loose and then all of a sudden the producer turns around and goes, who's this fucking guy? Who is he? Oh, he's my friend. And he's, you know what I mean? So, and, and also, you know, you try to be friendly and nice to people, but just realize your bounds. Like, don't be overly friendly. And, you know, you might, some people may not like to talk. So you, you should be able to realize that right away. And I learned my valuable lesson. So I'm, I'm in the, the Roy Sakala did most of John Lennon's solo stuff, and then he did a lot of other stuff in the 60s, and he was a, a tech at A&R, but very uh, famous, and he owned the, the record plant, and he took off for a number of years, and then when I started, he came back, so I got to work with him, with Garland Jeffries, you ever hear of Garland Jeffries, a singer-songwriter, New Yorker guy, uh, and Orleans. Oh, wow. So he came back to do records, and here it is, I'm working with him. But within the first few weeks of being there, you know, I walk in and I see all these people, you know, all rock and roll looking people, the, the thin guys and, you know, beautiful girls. And, you know, and then I start noticing stars. And that's the other thing, too, is if you're around famous people, that's a really good barometer of how they know if you're going to last or not. If you treat them like they're just someone else, like don't, you know, stare at them or something like that. Um, but... I noticed Lou Reed. He was working on his solo record from the bottom line, 1978. And I, there was one guy, Jay Krugman, was working there, and he was really funny. He got by, and I just started work, started, I walked in a couple days there, and there's Lou Reed, and Jay Krugman's behind me going, like that, kidding around, you know? But I actually got to sit in on a session with Roy, because Roy was kind of supervising. So we're in a session. It was me, Roy, an engineer, the assistant, and Lou Reed, and at that time, he was far gone. He was pretty out there. He had some fellow dressed up like a woman in the studio with him. But uh, in any case, um, Niels Lofgren came in. Do you remember? Yeah. You know, Niels Lofgren actually is, is Bruce Springsteen's guitar player. But he was an artist, too. Still is. Great guitar player. He walked in, and, and, and he is, he's quite short, Niels, you know? And I, I had his record, so I was like, oh, shit, Niels Lofgren. And I'm just keeping it nice and cool. <laughs> Nils leaves, and Lou Reed, after he left, Nils, uh, Lou Reed says, wow, Nils Lofgren is really small. I didn't know he was that small, just like that. And out of the blue, I said, yeah, I didn't know either, like that. And Lou Reed goes, what did you say? I, I said, I, I didn't think he was that small either, Lou. And he goes, you're a fucking asshole, just like that. And Roy, who was kind of like, <laughs> like I, I was his boy, and he was kind of taking care of me, he didn't say anything. He didn't say, like, oh, leave him alone, or... So it, that was like, and, and, when, and when I went home that day, I thought about it, and I thought to myself, you know right, he was right. I was an asshole, because I should have never said anything. And that's when I learned. I learned right back then from Lou Reed. Isn't that cool? That's a great first story. <laughs> yeah. You know, I always say to myself, like even when I'm arguing with my wife and my son, I'll say, what's the upside of me saying this? Uh -huh. I've learned in my old age to be like, what is the upside? If there's no perceivable upside, I just don't say it. That's but it, it's like that. It's like it took me so long because I found myself long. in that position where, yeah. like, for me, if someone, if Lou Reed said it to me, I would literally be replaying that in my right, head right. 
for, <laughs> for the week. Like, I'd be destroyed by it. I'd be like, yeah, you know, like yeah. people would say Joe, and they'd have yeah. to say my name multiple because I'd be replaying it. Yeah, yeah. Like, that stuff really gets to me because yeah, yeah. I don't want to be that guy. Right, exactly. You yeah, know, but it's yeah. like, so yeah. I slowly got a policy of like, wait a minute, take, give me, give me a five beat, and then in my five yeah. beat I go, is this, is there any upside? No, there's no upside? Okay. You know, I, remain silent. I, I, and, you know, and one more thing, an engineer, my mentor taught me, because I didn't know anything coming up, he taught me not to say anything. He said, if you don't know what they're talking about, right. just be quiet. Yes. They will assume that you know right. what they're right. talking right. about. Right. And it right. worked like a charm. Right. So people will be talking about something, you know, and we're going to change 6 8, and we're going to do a dotted 16 note, and we're going to go ahead and we're going to cut that there, and we're, you know, right. just be quiet. And they'd be like, all right, he's one of us. <laughs> That's a great one. <laughs> Inside, I'm like, I don't have, you know, good Lord, I don't know what to do with that. But yeah. All right, so you were an assistant at this point or an engineer? Well, no, I started in 78. I was just a runner, a gopher, a, a When did you start assisting and engineering? Well, um, it was about, uh, so 78 of May, I was there. I, I would say the following year, like se like late 79, so I started. So full year getting stuff. And yeah, and you know, they, it was like a couple years before other people. I, I, got, I, I got up there pretty quick because everybody liked me. And you were there a lot. And I was there all the time. Well, everyone was there all the time. You yeah. know what I mean? Uh, so, I, and like I said, I always hung out. And also, people knew I was Roy's boy. So I got to meet a lot of people that other guys wouldn't have. But do you, do you remember the first thing you were an engineer on? Uh, no, I don't. Because you remember the first important thing you were an engineer. Well, on? yeah, yeah, yeah. That I remember very, very well. I, it was Jay Giles, and it, it was it. it um, it was a great experience, one of the best, most fun things I've ever done. I learned a lot. I learned a lot from the Jay Giles band. They did most, like, Jay Giles came to Record Plant, I, I think Monkey Island was the name of the album, Joe mm -hmm. Wissert was the producer, and Roy started the record. Roy Sakala was known for, like Roy Sakala one time called up Jimmy Iovine. When Jimmy Iovine, you know who Jimmy is? Yeah. He started just like me. So um, Jimmy called him up on Thanksgiving or on Easter Sunday and said, can you work the front desk? And he said, yeah, I'll be right there. And that was, he was testing him. But he also left Jimmy Iovine in a studio alone with John Lennon and went home and he finished the session. And that's, that was his MO, that was Roy's MO. He would oh, start wow. engineers off, he started Dave Thoner off on Monkey Island, he said, I'm gonna be in my office if you need me, and Dave finished the record including separating the kick and the snare since Roy recorded it on the same track. <laughs> he recorded the kick and snare on the same track for oh, whatever boy. reason. But uh, well, those buses were tough in old consoles. You'd no, no, but he did it on purpose. But oh, he did it on purpose. On purpose. I, I don't know why. I don't know why. But uh, anyway, I, so I got, to, I got to hang out with Peter Wolf, was friendly with me, and wow. they were such a really cool band, and they, Jay taught me a lot about flying in. I got to, I was good at flying vocals in and stuff. So flying vocals in via tape machine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. in the old days, tell them how you would do it. Rather well, than you would take a, you know, you would take whatever your, take a you know what machine. flying in is, right? Does everyone understand? Uh, so whatever, like for instance, we did this song called uh, Flamethrower and it had a, it had a tom fill da, 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 to, to lead in. And then there was a breakdown and they wanted that same drum beat in the breakdown. So we went back to the beginning, we recorded that drum fill on a stereo piece of tape, and then we went to the turnaround, or the breakdown, and we flew it in. So the way Jay taught me was, you know, first you had to get, you had to scrub the tape against the heads to get right where the top of the fill is. Yeah. So what Jay was telling me was, is, okay, now just take that and, and thing and then roll it back and find another mark somewhere on the tape machine and figure out where you can start that tape machine. So it was like on the fore end of whatever it was. Just, excuse me, and then I would hit it and whatever I was off, I would go back to the same one and just add or subtract. It was, it was a little bit of a theory yeah. involved. And you know the 350 and 300 machines, the tape decks? Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, the old Ampex tape decks had um, a, a, a guard where you had to lift it up when you rewound it. So when you hit play, there was actually like a, you know, mm. yeah. There was so, capstan motor, was, yeah. it, it had, the capstan motor controlled the speed. Right. Unlike an Atari, look, like some machines, they've got motors and they got a capstan right. that controls it. But this was literally, when you hit stop or start, it would go. So you had to start it, anticipate. Yeah. You know, it was a lot of luck, but uh, that was cool. But anyway, so 
we did freeze frame. I assisted. I was the assistant engineer on freeze frame, and that was just wow. the mixing, and that lasted over a month. Actually, probably about six weeks to mix nine songs, and we spent minimum three days, sometimes five days on one song, uh, only because. What were the consoles in the? In that was the a Trident of? TSM that we had just got. Okay. There was no automation, and it was forty-eight track. Okay. Um, and actually, that, that's something too that I wanted to share with them. Not necessarily just about that particular record, but I will, since I'm talking about that record, that's, that's one of the best experiences I've ever had, even though it nearly killed Dave Thoner. Because, what, mixing with automation? Well, just working on the project entire, entirely, because okay. they were very... Uh, it still sounds great. Though. It does, right? Oh, Maybe yeah. a little bright, but really, really it's good. Amazing yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the, during, um, like, everyone was there, the whole band was there, and they're, they're a very uh, tight-knit bunch, and... Um, I, I, I don't want to say strange, weird, they're just different. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they didn't like people hanging around. Uh, they had two roadies with them. Jim Donnelly was one, he had a stutter. And whenever people came in to visit them, when they were done with them, they didn't have the nerve to just say, okay, we got to get back to work. They would tell Jim Donnelly to get them out of there and they would say it with a code. They'd say, Jim, have you heard from Bob from Montreal yet? And he would say, no, we haven't yet. I, I, I'll, get, I'll try to get all of them. Oh, excuse me, can you come here? And he would just very politely steer them out, and that was really, really cool. <laughs> but when we were mixing, like, like uh, the producer always wanted to, so it was on an Ampex 1200, and I had to slate every mix. We would always go at least up to 100, and those were the days, you know, wow. you talk about analog tape, people talk about analog tape, we always recorded on virgin tape. Do you understand what that means, virgin tape? Yeah. So that means when you hit start and you hit play, if we hit the multi-tracks and we started to mix and we made a mistake, oh, let's go again. Just stop the tape machine, the next take, we never rewound. So that's why we had 100 takes, you know what I mean? It's, but the producer always wanted to get in on one take, he didn't want to do any edits. So it took us quite a while to get a take. We had five people on, on the console doing moves. We had 48 track and analog, and that was, um, they had just figured out 48. I think we had a BTX unit. I don't know if you know what that is. Mm -hmm. It was like a little white console that you, you know, it, it, you, you needed, you needed uh, Symphony on track 24, and then we always kept 23 open because right, we didn't believe. Yeah. So basically we only had 44 tracks. Listen to me, only 44. Um, and when you hit play, there would be at least three seconds to, to you know, get caught up. Oh, see, so we're locking two 24 tracks. Two 24 tracks. Yeah. So that's 44 tracks. There were minimum six to 10 tracks on every song that had multiple things right. on tracks. Like a tambourine would be a guitar solo. Right, exactly. Would be a background exactly. Vocal. And we only had 56 inputs. So that meant that a lot of things, we couldn't mold them. So that meant we had to physically put EQs in and out, right. and inserts in and out, on um, the beat because of the clicks that they right, made. Yeah. So all during the mix, we, we were literally, I, I, I remember having to walk One up, guy makes a mistake, walk up over thing. around the other side of the console and punch a bus in on a certain solo and, and walk back out. You know what I mean? That kind yeah. of vibe. And the other thing too, Joe, this is what I'm getting at. And you can watch this on Pink Floyd when they do the uh, uh, Dark Side of the Moon, uh, who's the engineer? Um, uh, Alan, Par Alan, Alan Parsons. Alan Parsons, he talks about this, <clears throat> and he says the same thing, we were all part of the mix. And when you're recording on analog tape, when you're mixing, obviously you have to be on input in order to hear it. But then when you play it back, it's a different story. It doesn't come back exactly like right. you're listening through it. You know, there's many, you know, obviously. Yeah. Bias tape compression. Right, exactly, yeah. yeah. But of course we had a great, uh, staff and, and they and there was you know the machines were aligned perfectly but still you still have to listen back because of tape compression for sure mm -hmm. so it wasn't until you played back that you actually got to hear what the moves you did and stuff but I'm telling you that when we got the mix and I can still see it to this day you know like you're sitting there you're listening and the songs over and you look at each other and you got that smile the state of euphoria that came about mm -hmm. all of us is not there anymore. You can't get that anymore. I miss, I miss some of those analog, old school making records. Yes, and you know, everything we did, with, it was like manual labor. And yeah. I, to this day, when I hear freeze frame, I know the moves I did. 
And I had this, I spent a week editing that record. They put me up the, at the, um, the hotel, uh, hotel around the corner. Um, I forget the name of it. But I can hear every edit I did on that record. You know, but, but like I said, this, the, when you listen back and you go, I helped make that. You know, I helped, I contributed to that. And it's, it, was, it, was, uh, it was fun. And even doing like tape flanging. Yeah, we talked about that last week. Or something that we don't do anymore, and if you can tell me how, show me. But backwards guitar solos were a big thing back then. And now we're talking 80s, and I don't have to tell you about the climate of New York City in the 80s making rock records, okay? We worked many hours. A lot of health nuts. A lot of health nuts, <laughs> yeah, real healthy. But we worked a lot of hours and reworked a lot of hours because for some reason the thing before, the night before was sounding really bright for some reason. <laughs> Spending 20 hours a day, minimum. Well, I would say with the Jay Giles band thing, that record, minimum 14 hours a day. So we were spending a lot of time in the studio, and when they said, hey, let's do a, a, a and the assistant engineer, like, nowadays the assistant engineer, God, thank, thank God bless them, because they got to take care of, you know, they take care of Pro Tools and stuff, but if you're mixing on a console, there's nothing for the assistant to do. And I find the assistants nowadays are reading the magazine or doing this or doing that. When I was an assistant, I could, my hand was on the tape machine all the time. We didn't have remotes. So I had to rewind and stuff. And the freeze frame record, the tape were so old that I had to clean the heads before rewinding every time. So, and then when we do backwards guitar, so a backwards guitar solo, do you understand the concept of that? I mean, can you think in your head how you would do a backwards solo? On analog tape. On analog tape, can anyone tell me how that, that's possible? I don't expect you to know, because you don't the tape do. tape upside down? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you say take, take it upside down, you don't, you have to physically undo the tape and put one reel on the other and you then flip this. it over. So you would go. Right. Well, you, it's not, you don't quite do it like that, though. No. But that's the, that's but the that's net the result. Theory, but, but the way to do that is, first of all, you have to, t you know, now we worked on an Ampex, but you release the tension on the, on the things, and then you take one reel and you put it on top of the other, and then you just turn them both upside down. But all the time, you have to be real careful not to crimp that tape, okay? So, but before even doing that, you know, the solo is eight bars, and the guitar player listens to it, okay. I gotta be in that key there, okay, fine. So what, then the thing you have to do is then, when you play the solo forward, you have to stop right after the solo, and then flip the tape. Therefore, when you hit play, the end of the solo plays to the beginning of it. D does everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, you know, so you play the tapes, okay, let well, me tell see. Tell me what else you have to do. Track 12 is, let's use track 12. Okay, fine. Flip the tape over, 12. No, no, that's not 12 anymore, because it's upside down. You gotta count the head stack. And you know, 12 on a 24 one o'clock in the morning, you yeah, know, yeah, after yeah. working 12 hours, and you know, then, then you have to, when you hit play, then you have to get used to where, you know, everything's backwards. So you have to realize where you are. So then when the guitar player does something, the only way to play it back is to flip the tape. So we're talking flipping the tape many times. And what I'm getting at is, when it was done, once again, the state of euphoria thing. was like, you climbed Mount Everest. <laughs> right. And you know, it's like, I got to work a lot with Jay Messina and Jack Douglas. Together, they made most of the Aerosmith hits. Uh, Walk This Way, is, it, is Walk This Way, is that the one? Uh, like this, da -da 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 -da. is that? Yeah. yeah. Um, is that the song where there's, there's a backwards hi-hat in that? Is it that one or Sweet, Sweet Emotion? I think there's a backwards hi-hat or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So that meant that they had to play the hi-hat forward on those beats. So to just to get that, you know, that's... So here's the other thing that you don't realize. With a backwards guitar solo, the guitar player has to learn the solo that backwards. Backwards, yeah, exactly. So he's got to play it in reverse to get it what he wants, right? So like, for instance, if you go into Pro Tools and you hit reverse, let's say you track a reverb, you have a snare and you have, you print a reverb from the snare and then you say, I'm gonna reverse it. When you reverse it, all it does is reverse the reverb. On a snare, if you get backward snares on an analog tape, each backward snare will be off of the snare that you hit. Yeah. Versus in digital, the digital world, the last snare is the first snare. 
So you really can't do it the same yeah. way as you could do in the yeah, old days. Yeah, you yeah. have to sort of build your backward stuff yeah. in Pro Tools to do yeah. it right. Yeah. I don't know if I'm explaining that. In my head, I know what I'm saying, but <laughs> there, it is a real, it's a real like abstract concept. Yeah. yeah. And there yeah, was yeah. guys, we, had a, we did a record where a guy learned the, to sing this part backwards. Oh, wow. So he sang it backwards and we played oh, it forward and he was my... singing forward, but it sounded like he was Oh backwards. my God, that's... And when you did it, wow. or like when you were talking about tape flanges, we would... Do a tape flange, and tape when you got the flange. tape flange just right, oh, you would man. use a you would use like a Zeta machine to lock your two track up with your twenty four track. You'd throw, let's say, in the center section, you want everything to flange except for the vocal, so you don't send the vocal the over the two track. Bass is another one where you would. Okay, so maybe you don't put the bass, you don't put the vocal in it. So all, all that lives on this two track is a full mix without bass and vocals. So when you play it back, the machines lock up, and you're coming up to that section in your mix. And then you just put your thumb on the capstan motor and slow it, and it would try to speed back up to get it in, and you would cross, the, the envelope would cross over, overshoot it and come back, and you'd get these, you'd have to do it maybe five, ten times. Yeah, yeah right? oh yeah, oh yeah. But well, it paid off whenever well, see, you got we, it done. We, you were we really had an oscillator, and I'm telling you, Joe, the oscillator had, it, first of all, the oscillator was built into this rack that was this tall, and we had one for four rooms. Oh, let's, we want to slow down the safety. All right, is the oscillator available? Yeah, bring it in. Then you had to plug it in and warm it up. So what year is this? 78. Uh, so well, this is before, like, Timelines and Zeta Smith. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Because, like, well, I We didn't lock up any tapes like you're talking about. This is my, my, yeah. my life in that sense is probably 10 years after. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I 10 years was, after, Alvin Lee. I thought it was a nightmare when I did it. But, I but really the imagine. thing is, though, the knob to, to, to you know, to, to get to slow up or speed up was, like, this big. But what you did know, the oscillator do? So the it tone, sped up or slowed down. So it controlled the motor. It controlled somehow? the motor. Yes, exactly. So when I say oscillator, maybe it wasn't like a tone generator. So but you it could was turn this up in the speed VSO, of the whatever a VSO. Very speed operation. Right, right. That's what it was. It was a VSO. Huh. Right, right. And so then, so for flanging, you know, it, it was a matter of just moving it just a little. But as you're doing it, you can. But hear you had it. to move it so it would do yeah. the. It yeah, exactly. Would do its yes, 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 yes. Well, I was telling these guys, it's like. I feel I'm, I'm a little bit, I was a little bit annoyed. People now, they'll shoot an hour's worth of video and then just grab the audio and throw it in. Back in the day when we right. had to sync right. audio to video, it was literally, you had to get like a PhD. It was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you yeah, had yeah. to study it and you still didn't understand yeah. it until you did it for a couple yeah. of years. It was a nightmare locking this machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You would have Simpty drop out and you'd have something called Jam Sync where it would then oh, yeah. free wheel time code over right, gas. Right, yeah. It was like yeah. you were landing a space shuttle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now exactly. these kids are like, what are you talking about? I just grab the file yeah. and I put it into GarageBand yeah. and it, I hit a button and it locks it all up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And literally, like a whole part of our education that was painful, very painful, is like, I, Not even needed. I, I walked into a session at Blackbird, John McBride, the owner, uh, he was in there doing something with a band, and he says, check out this intro, and he played me this like 20 second intro that was really cool. He has a live chamber, and it was just all this really interesting, it sounded like the beginning of, the Pink, of a Pink Floyd song. Too bad it, the rest of the song didn't. But anyway, um, when I heard it, I was like, I said, John, you know what, that, that's at least a day's work. You know, back in the day, he goes, yeah, we, we did this in about five minutes, you know, so that, it's exactly. The, but having said that, though, wouldn't it have been cool 50 years ago to have been able to do that in five seconds? You know, well, I'm not, but I miss the camaraderie yeah, of like yeah, a yeah. room full of yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah. a lot of times I'm high fiving yeah. myself. Yeah, yeah, in a yeah, dark yeah, bar. yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. That is what I miss I for miss sure. I miss having yeah, guys absolutely. Saying, oh, or somebody in the back where you're yeah. working, you're trying yes. really hard, you're losing perspective, then your yes. assistant says, Yes. That is so cool. And then you're like, you're able to go for another two hours. And you know, it. the thing is, like, do you all want to be engineers, producers, both, or whatever? You're just learning this for whatever. I don't know if you're all, if you all want to get a job as an engineer somewhere, which I don't know, that's like a career because studios don't hire engineers. But the way it was for me, I don't know, if Joe, if you were in the same boat, but I started at the record plant. It, it, the path was a general or, or a gopher, an assistant, an engineer. So you learned, you be, eventually became an engineer. Uh, and then I was hanging out with people just to be able to get in there and sit in as an assistant. Oops, I'm sorry, I'm touching my thing. And then I got to be an assistant with some engineers that let me do things. Like for instance, mm -hmm. getting a cue mix was a big deal. Because that, that, that taught me how to get to mix. And the other thing too, it's funny because I- Headphone mix. Headphone mix. Uh, now, they used to do them on the console. You'd have aux yeah. ends and you'd, it was a nightmare. 
but you would yeah. do it on these like concerts would have 10 cents and you'd get the drummer a mix you'd get the other guy a mix. well we only had one mix for everybody a mono mix that's, that's almost better but the thing is too is like nowadays in pro tools excuse me like if i'm cutting a track in a studio you know i'm listening and by the way when when i you all understand what tracks cutting tracks you understand the terminology used right i'm not trying to be uh what do you call it, condescending but uh I want to make sure everybody knows what I'm talking about. When I'm cutting tracks, I want it to sound, in my opinion, when you cut tracks, that's the beginning of your record. That's your foundation right there. You're building a house, you're building a record, you're cutting tracks, okay, here's my balance. I love the way this sounds. Then you take that session and you're, now you're gonna work in your house the next day. Well, you can copy what you have on the console into Pro Tools and you've got your balance. And then let's say uh, the following week you go to New York and you're working in the studio. Well, guess what? You, on a zip drive, you plug it in, there's your balance. Mm -hmm. Well, when we were working, I hate to say back in the day, but in my, in my time, you know, you cut tracks in A and then you can do overdubs in B. Well, guess what? You put the tape on the machine and you get a rebalance of whatever you had. We never kept notes or anything. So the rebalancing of tracks is what I started doing too. Like waiting for the engineer to come in. I said, all right, it's Dave, what song you wanna start with? Okay, so I started getting a balance. Just to, and sure enough, that's what helped me go ahead in my career because my, the engineers used to rely on me and say, oh, Steve's got it, you know? So that's how I learned how to mix doing cues and balances. When did you, so you ended up engineering a lot as like a, of staff engineer. Staff engineer. How yes. Long, how long? It took you about two, three years to get where you. Eighty four is when I started. So getting back to the Giles thing, when when Jay Giles, when they started to do their record after Freeze Frame, sadly Peter Wolf left the band. So they were without their singer, which a lot of bands try to do, but they they didn't. Well, they did, but they released a record. It didn't do much. And the engineer they had up there was fired, and they called me in 1984 up to. Uh, Longview Farms. Oh yeah, in Massachusetts. Yeah, the yeah, barn. It's, it's a nice place to be As for a weekend. Was an SSL in there at that point? No, there or? was. A, it was an MCI. Oh yeah. But we had the whole oh. place, so we had the barn and the guest and the farm. Beautiful house. studio up in up in uh, Massachusetts, and those MCI consoles were pervasive around New York City. And yeah. Were, yes. Yes. They were the Mackie console of pro and, studios. And Roy Sakala said the SSL was the future of MCI. That's why he never got one. Well, they were not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh man, they were horrible. Yeah. But, but it was quite an experience being up there and I learned a lot and it was kind of cool. Okay, so. so you start engineering in New York. Yes. How many years as an engineer in New York? What are some of the records you worked on, some of the memorable records? You were on, you worked with John Lennon? Yes, well, as John, an assistant? I, I was an assistant and I, well, okay, so that was 80. I, I learned how to, to, to work the BTX unit is what it was called, okay? Was that the oscillator thing? Yeah, no, no, that's the machine to keep the two machines together. Okay, I thought that was the oscillator, what you called the oscillator. No, the BTX is the unit that, it was a little white board and, you know, this machine is at this, um, you know, SMPTE and this is at the other SMPTE and if it's off, you have to subtract or minus and all that. Gotcha. You know? So I had worked on the Blues Brothers. Uh, you sure you're not talking about SBX? No, it was called the BTX. BTX. Okay. It's a little white console. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, I had worked on the soundtrack of the Blues Brothers album, and that was about six months. As a matter of fact, I said, I'm not gonna shave until this record's over, and that's why I have a beard today. <laughs> um, and that was, I mean, I can talk to you like a week about that record, so I won't, I won't bore you with it, but that was pretty intense. But I had the BTX down, I had it down, because it was a lot of that, you know, a lot of two machines and stuff. And John Lennon, who had previously done all his stuff at the record plant with Roy Sakala, him and Yoko, that's when he came out of retirement and did Double Fantasy with Yoko, with Jack Douglas, who was staff at Record Plant, and went to the Hit Factory, who was our arch rivals. There was bad blood between the two, so that was kind of a drag. But he did the record there. But during the process of that record, they needed to come to Record Plant to, to do something, and they asked if I was available because I knew how to run the two machines. The producer of the Blues Brothers didn't want to give me up. He says, no, man, I, I rely on Steve. You know, even though a lot of that session was just sitting around <laughs> doing nothing. But you know, I, my boss uh, taught me a great lesson. He says, don't, don't get excited about the name. You know, you're, 
your, you know, your word, you're giving the word, you're, you're doing that session, okay, if someone comes by with a, a bigger act or something, you gave them your word. So right. I learned that, okay, I'm working for this producer, he's been very nice to me, sorry, I can't work with John Lennon. And I had to, you know, I, I didn't get to do it, so I was completely bummed. But then in December of that year, 1980, way after the record was out, there was already a couple of singles, they had made enough music uh, for Double Fantasy. Hey, Jack. What's your name? Jack. Jack, how are you, man? I'm good. Um, this is Steve Marcantonio. During, uh, the, when they made Double Fantasy, they made enough re uh, songs for two records. They came out with Milk and Honey, I think it was the follow-up record. But they had this one song that they had cut called Walking in Thin Ice, and you know that John and Yoko both did songs for that project. So this song, Walking on Thin Ice, they wanted to release it. Uh, it was 80, so there was disco, and it was kind of like a club song. It's, it was really cool, cool song. So I was available, and they called on me. So I got to, to work with John and Yoko. Wow. Um, Jack was the producer, and he engineered it too. So you know, we came in on a, we went, came in on a Monday, and we listened to the tracks. Um, great musicians, Earl Slick and um, Andy Newmark, and you know. Just you, uh, McCracken, and so there was all this. You know you? I've met you, yeah. I oh yeah, I was I was friends. Uh, yeah, he was amazing. Well, well, yeah. Sadly, he's not with us anymore. Human Cracker. Anyway, uh, we we stripped everything off there that we didn't want to use or replace. John played guitar and keyboards, and Yoko sang. So it, mm. it took us a week to do that one song. You know, uh, yeah. A week of Yoko's vocals. Well. But John played guitar and keyboards, and that, you know, there, there was a process. The first day was listening, the second day was setting up for doing, you know, it was, back in those days, it, nothing was done like that. It took, you know, it took a while. Uh, but, you know, the first day, I, I clearly remember it, you know, here it is, you know, j you know I, I, I remember when the Beatles first came to America. You know, I'm 61 years old, you know, I remember waking up that February and looking at the Daily News and seeing the, Eagle, the, Eagles, Eagle, the Beatles landed at JFK or something like that. So I'm a Beatle fanatic. And so 1980, I'm thinking, you know, John Lennon, he was the Beatle. And, and I admired him the most because he was, uh, my brother was a Catholic priest and he admired John Lennon. You know, he thought he was, you know, a, a great man. And he was, he was a great man. I mean, he had a rocky past, but he was, you know, he was all about love and peace. You know, so when I, when the first day he came in, I, you know, I was, I didn't even look at him. I was so nervous and I had heard horror stories about Yoko, how she, how she used to make engineer, assistant engineers cry. So I was, I was, I was ready. I was there, I was ready to go and I just concentrated on Jack, the producer engineer. What do you need? Okay, boom. And I, oh, for sure, you know, I can hear him. I'm like, holy shit, he's, he's right there. It's one of the Beatles. And then he had an interview that first day, that afternoon with, somebody from England and they were talking and you know and, and I heard him say yeah well when we did love me do you know and it I was like holy shit that's him right there it's like you know I know I don't know if you know we've all worked with very famous people big personalities but you know there was nothing like right. him you know and, and he was one of you know I had met several people before that but he's by far the the biggest personality I ever met. And like I said, I didn't want to look at him, but slowly but surely, I I'm got- I'm nervous it. listening to this story because I don't want you to have a bad interaction with John Lennon. Right, like, exactly. I want, your, I want your story <laughs> with, like, I'm like secretly like, yeah, oh God, yeah, I hope yeah, it went well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, did it? <laughs> Amazing, yeah. absolutely. The next day, he, we cut the ice, and I remember it was either the third or fourth day, you know, like, for instance, I even got Yoko to laugh because, do you understand, you know what a bus is when someone says, like, oh, let's use bus one, you know, and I remember when I first started, I didn't know what anything, a bus, what's a bus? And uh, Steve Barish, one of the local uh, uh, um, uh, techs, I, I, and whenever I asked a tech a question, they would give me such a technical answer, and I was like, but this guy, Steve, I was like, Steve, what's a bus? He goes, well, a bus is something that takes a signal from one place to the other, like, for instance, if you want to go to New Jersey, you go to the Port Authority, you get a bus, and it takes you to... Right. And that was like, holy shit, that's right. what a that's bus how is. I, that's the exact analogy that's what, someone right, told right. me. And I was like, oh. And 
so we're upstairs with John and Yoko, and bus came up. A bus came up, and someone said something about bus. I said, yeah, and if there's not enough buses here with this Port Authority right over there, and Yoko cracked up. So I think they, they, once again, we talked about personality in the beginning, and they took a liking to me. It, it was obvious. That's cool. And John did this solo. You, you got to listen to it. It was, a, it was, you know, listening back now to some of the Beatles songs, even I don't realize that John played some of the, 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 the guitar. I thought George played every, uh, every lead lick, George. But John played a lot of the nasty stuff. And the solo that he did was just... What's the name of the song? On Thin Ice? Walking on Thin Ice. And it's on Double Fantasy? No, no, it, it was a separate release. Okay. It was way after. But he did this solo where all it was... <laughs> it was just single notes, but really haunting sound because the song was really haunting. So it was an incredible solo. And during the solo, he was doing that, and I'm sitting right next to him. So then every time the solo came up, he would turn to me, and we would play air guitar like that. You know, wow. he was just, you know, like, like, like after that happened, I remember working with bands that'd go, hey, can we leave our guitar here overnight? I says, sure, John Lennon left his. You know what I mean? It was that yeah. kind of, he was really down to earth. So, you know, we, we mixed it and it was like a Saturday or a Sunday. They came in on that Sunday to listen and we worked till about five in the morning, that going into Monday morning. And New York City is busy 24 seven, except for Sunday night, Monday morning, like from about maybe two o'clock in the morning till about four in the morning. There's no one in New York City. So it was about three o'clock in the morning and Jack Douglas, we were all fried. And Jack's like, Let, you know, let's just take five minutes, you know, and, and at that point I was hanging on with the thread because I was beat. It, we had already been there six days in a row, no sleep. And it was freezing, it was, it was winter time. I says, Jack, I need, to, I need to get some air. I'm gonna take a walk. I grab my coat, I start walking out and I hear, hold on, I'll come with you. John came with me and just him and I walked around the block by ourselves. And the thing is, is that I'm walking wow. around the block and I'm going, no one is here to see this. <laughs> and I'm walking around, I'm going, yeah. I'm with, you know. But the fact of the matter is John Lennon, back in those days, he lived in New York City. He walked around with no entourage and no, no bodyguards. He was part of, of, the, of the city. So mm -hmm. I got a chance to walk. That's the highlight of my career, for sure. Getting to, and he said that when that Beatles became famous in the early years, they were in neighborhoods where the gangs there didn't like them because the girls liked the Beatles. And he remembers running away from one gang and he turned around and he threw his hat on the ground and they all stopped and stomped on it and gave them enough time to get away. Wow. Isn't that cool? Yeah. And, and the other thing too is John had gear. In his, he had, they had five apartments at the Dakotas in New York City. I don't know if you've ever been in New York, but if you do go to New York, the Dakotas, first of all, is a work of art. It's a turn of the century building right on Central Park West and 72nd Street. And to live there now is anywhere in New York is ridiculous, but they had like five or six apartments. And I think in one of the songs, John said, yeah, you can, that we got, I got you that one so you can put your coats in there or something like that. You know, they probably used some of those apartments just for storage, but he was a gear nut. He always collected gear and it's before your time, but you might remember there's a thing called the clap track. And all it was was a box with a button that just made claps. Oh yeah, hand yeah. Claps. I just saw it. It was on Facebook recently. They oh. reissued. Oh right, right. That's right, right, right. So ironically, it was a, it was manufactured somewhere in New Jersey, and I don't know how we found out, but I found out. Oh, I can get it to New Jersey. He goes, oh, pick me up one. Yeah, and it was. So he gave me two hundred dollars, two crisp one hundred dollar bills. I said, no problem. I'll get it for you. You know. Who, John Lennon? Yes. What? So. Uh, the thing I forgot to you tell you. You didn't know the track was, was code for heroin. <laughs> <laughs> he was. He's like, what's with the drum machine? Totally <laughs> sober. No, not one ounce of drug or liquor at all. There was none of that going on. He was totally sober, totally cool. But he gave me the money. <coughs> <coughs> so during the, you know, it was Sunday. So I knew, okay, and next day or Tuesday, I'll go with this claptrap. And I'm freaking bringing it to John Lennon at the Dakota. You know, I'm, I'm thinking, all right, I'm in. I'm in because yeah, this is what is your me. life now. So the thing I neglected to tell you is the day that I started on Monday was December 1st, 1980. And that Monday, the following Monday was December 8th. Mm. I had another session that night. He and Yoko left at about seven, eight o'clock. I had to set up for another session. An hour later, he was gone. Wow. And 
I thought it was a hoax, right? I said, there's no way. I mean, he just left. There can't be. And, you know, it, it, that, you know, rocked my world. And I had these two crisp $100 bills. And I'm thinking to myself, what do I do? You know, so yeah. the good old Italian Catholic altar boy in me is like, I'm, I can't keep this. I got to give it back to that incredible millionaire that is missing it. I'd give know? two other $100 bills. <laughs> <laughs> So I gave it back. But oddly enough, a week to the day he was shot, Yoko was back in the studio with me and Jack with these big black glasses with three huge bodyguards. And during the making of Double Fantasy, they had a Nagra tape machine, which is used in film. Who's in, someone's in film, right? You know what a Nagra is? I don't even know if they make them anymore. I've never heard of it. Oh, okay, it's a Nagra. small reel-to-reel -reel that's like for remote. For location? Yeah. And they had one of those in the control room and they wanted everything John said. So what we did was Yoko wanted to put a collage of things that were said to this music backdrop, and we spent a day in there, and that was really intense. I bet. Very tough. But I gave Yoko the money back, and a few weeks later, I got a platinum uh, double fantasy record, even though I didn't work on it. So mm. on top of that, check this out. Tom Ponunzio, do you know Tom? Mm -mm. Tom was an engineer there. He's a producer. He's pretty well known. It, well, I mean, he's out in L.A. Not pretty. Uh, it, he worked a lot with Jimmy Iovine, and he got to be close with Jimmy out in L.A. He uh, had worked with John. Everybody worked with John because he was there all the time. So he had asked me, and mind you, the whole time I was there at Record Plant, I never asked for autographs because it was like, that's, you don't do that. That's not cool. Tom said, Steve, ask John for an autograph for my nephew, please, you know. So I did that, and... I had the autograph. I had the autograph, and here it is. When we learned the news, Tom was downstairs working with Willie Nile. Everybody stopped. We had a full house. Everybody stopped working. I took that autograph, and like a good Catholic boy, I went down and I gave it to Tom. Hmm. I think that autograph got like $100,000 or something like that. Do I kick myself in the ass for not, you know, that it was, you know, yeah, I had to give it back. So, sure. but, um, that, you know, I mean, to say that's the highlight of my career, I mean, how could I top that? Right. Other than to say there's one other thing I did that I'm the most proud of. You know, uh, uh, you know, I come from an incredible family. You know, my brothers are still close. I still have cousins. My mother and father were saints. <clears throat> and my mother, she couldn't sing to save a note, but she would sing and it would be, you know, out there. Um, she found out she had health problems. Uh, she had a bad heart. And my brother was into Neil Young, and she says, and she would hear the song Helpless. She goes, that's me, I'm helpless, helpless. She would sing it really off key. <laughs> she loved Bridge Over Troubled Waters. She says, I want that played at my funeral, you know. Mm. I did a song with uh, Gretchen Peters. She's a local writer. I don't know if you're familiar with Gretchen. Mm -hmm. Maybe one of the best songwriters I've ever worked with. She, wrote, she writes mostly everything herself. She, the only co-writer is Brian Adams. She writes a song with Ben Glover. I just had him here last week, actually. What was that? You know Ben Glover? No, where are you from? From Ireland. Oh, that's why the Tullamore do. Yeah, I know. for sure have me gotten. Yeah, I was keeping them out here. I didn't know that. <laughs> okay. My best friend's parents are from Belfast and uh, the other Irish city, whatever, whatever that other. Uh, Dublin? Dublin. Yeah, yeah. That other Irish city. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yes, yeah, there might be a smattering, but most of her songs, and I did a song with her, her called When You Are Old. And it talks about getting old, when you're old and tired and gray and wear your overcoat on a sunny day. You know, and I have a video somewhere I gotta show it. It's a, it it's, I play the song for my mother and there's a picture of my wife and my daughter. So it's like three generations almost. And when my mother heard the song, she says, I want this song played at my funeral. Mm. So th I'd say that's the highlight of my career. Mm. You know, I, and even though I got a Grammy and a CMA award, having that distinction of, of my mother wanting something that I did yeah, played. that's great. Because my mother and father both died to, with music on. You know, music was a Did big, they get to see you? They got to obviously see you be successful in music. Yes, yes. So yeah. That's a great thing. And the other thing, too, real quickly, I, I told you I worked with the Blues Brothers, so a real quick story, but... Um, tying in with the autograph, he, he, I got an autograph from John, too, from my butcher. But let me tell you that story real quick, because my mother got to meet John Belushi. And um, 
So we're working on the Blues Brothers. My mother used to cook dishes for me to bring in. You know, Peter Wolf had her lasagna, and John Belushi had her veal parmesan. Um, we, I brought in veal parmesan for me, the engineer and the producer, and we're eating, and John stopped by. He goes, hey, what are you doing? Oh, we're eating veal parm. You want some? Oh, no, that's all right. So he leaves, and it's like 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, and the phone rings. And back then, when the receptionist left, you're in the room, and all of a sudden, you see the light blinking, you know? And you had to answer the phone, even with the music blasting. You had to go, oh, all right, you know. And it was John. <laughs> he goes, what are you doing? You still there? I said, yeah. He goes, any veal cutlet left? I said, yeah. He came in and ate the, like, the last four or five pieces of veal cutlet. <laughs> and sure enough, I got a, 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 an autograph for my butcher. And he put it up in his store. So, uh, you know, my mother awesome. and father were at the studio one day. We went out to dinner. And we walk out of the record plant, and there's John and Judy, his wife, walking down the street. I said, John, you know, and, and that's the way it was. You know, we, I got to be friends with these people. And John, at that particular night, was the cleanest I'd ever seen him. You know, because I, I'm not going to get into stories of, of how else I saw him. But he was refreshed. I thought for sure, all right, this is it. He's, he's better now. He was with his wife. John, it's my, my mom. Oh, so, and they hugged, and so that, that was a big deal. Yeah, that's you great. Know. So yeah. you were, at this point, you were a regular, regular engineer in town. How long were you engineering in New York City? I was only engineering for like uh, two, three years. Okay. And, and I really didn't, I, I, I don't want to, you know, like he gave me such a good glowing remark to begin with. I didn't really do any major records there. Uh, I did a lot Other of than John Lennon records. Jay well, Giles. I was an assistant. I did a Jay Giles album. You know, I, my wife says I should never, I should always talk up about myself, but I, I'm too honest to, you know, I got my break when I came down here. So what made you come? Okay, so in, so in 1980, I think it was around 86, both Roseanne uh, and Rod, Rodney Crowell is a, a, a singer songwriter, an artist. He's had a lot of success as an artist and a songwriter. He's from Texas. Uh, in 86, he was married to Roseanne Cash, who was Johnny Cash's daughter. And they were in New York doing their records because they were not, you know, they were country artists, but they were oh, hipper. So. Yeah. yeah. So I was there with Rodney, and Dave Thoner was the engineer. And Rodney had to fix a vocal. And those were the days, like I said to you, I got my start because I worked closely with the engineer, and Rodney had to fix a vocal. He says, Steve, can you go with Rodney and do this up in C? So I got a chance to engineer, even though I was working with Dave. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. I was an engineer at the time. Dave hired me to do this thing with Rodney. So I went into the studio with Rodney to match the sound that he had already in order to fix a vocal. And that's something that I, uh, I knew how to do that because I had done it before with other engineers. I knew what to listen for. I knew the microphone, the chain. So he was so impressed with that that like a couple of years later, he called me up, it was 87, it was around May in 87, and asked me if I would come down here to record a few songs for a best of album for Roseanne, which actually turned into a whole record. It was King's Record Shop, which was critically acclaimed. And we all know critically acclaimed records mean that they're not hits, <laughs> that they don't sell. <laughs> you know, if everybody in the room loves what you're doing, it's not gonna be a hit. But I came down here and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, it's funny because I was talking with uh, Tony Brown earlier. Tony Brown is very successful country engineer, Vince Gill, Reba. He produced Rodney Crow. So wh when I came down here uh, to work with Roseanne, uh, he showed me around. And I remember seeing one studio called Soundstage where you walk into the room and there's no wall dividing the, like this. It was just the control room. There was the control room and then there was the studio, no wall in, in between. So they would do everything on headphones, and I saw an electronic kit. I'm like, drum. I said, who's playing that? They go, oh, Russ Kunkel. I was like, Russ? Kunkel? I mean, I don't know if you know who Russ Kunkel is. He, you know, he was, you know, part of the uh, what was the name of the the session, the session players? What were they called? The uh, Wrecking Crew? No, oh. it wasn't the Wrecking Crew. It was something else. In any case, he played, played a lot of James Taylor James records. Taylor, I know that. Carly Simon, and Russ. I, I got to record him. I learned a lot from him. He was a very dynamic drummer. So you, I don't know how dynamic you can be on, Not in those on days. digital drums, right. you know? Boom, yeah, yeah, boom, yeah, boom. yeah. So SPS that was H. interesting. But I came here with a New York mentality and a rock vibe. So I put up room mics for drums, you know, and stuff like that. And I got to meet, you know. You know for that electric kit you put up? Yeah, 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 right. <laughs> it's funny though, because <laughs> a couple of things that I recorded here that I never was familiar back in New, New York, 
mainly acoustic guitars. We never really played acoustic guitars. Um, cross stick. Mm -hmm. Never recorded a cross stick. And, you know, down here, you know, it's the first verse is a cross stick, you know. And, you know, of course, getting a, a good snare sound and then you go to the cross stick sound, it's, Right. You know, there, there's definitely a, a, a you know, it, it's, it's all about a, the drummer. With yeah, that. yeah, exactly. You're either going to kill it or you're going to be. So th those were the days where they had samples. And for this cross stick, just hit a pad for it. And it, would, it was a horrible sample. So when I first came here, you know, you get nice room sounds. And all of a sudden he goes to the cross stick and there's nothing in the room. So that's something I, I, I was, you know, I had, a, there was a big, that wasn't a big lure. It was culture shock when I came down. So here. you did that at soundstage, the Rodney Crowell thing. No, no, the Rodney Crowell thing we did at the, at Emerald. Oh, at yeah. Emerald. That yes. was the old, so the RCA building on, in downtown. That was now... an Emerald. Oh, Emerald, Emerald was. Emerald Benchmark. 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 Yeah, did, yeah I right. Spent maybe I was thinking of Havelina. Five, Wasn't six years. was that called Havelina yes, for a minute? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah, I spent a lot of time at Emerald. Um, and, you know, I, I came here with the, like, like I said, with a rock mentality and, you know, I'm in New so York. So you moved, you just... Oh, no, right. no, I came here in 87. I, tra I, I commuted for five years. So you're coming back and forth. And back eventually and forth. said, I'm going I to still did forth. things in New York, but, but, but I didn't really make a name for myself, you know, and, you know, I, I, I had a few clients. I didn't have a lot of clients. Um, so uh, I got more and more work down here. I met more people. I met people who transplanted from, New, from California mostly, Josh Leo being one of them, and mm -hmm. he got a job at, at BNA. He was a an A&R guy saw it. I was booked six months out back in, you know, 80, late 80, 90s. There was, in the 90s, there were 22 record companies. And I was always booked six months out. So I was working nonstop. Um, but yeah, but, but so I, I was, I, you know, I, I was a new face, you know, and also I was, a, you know, an Italian guy from Jersey. So I, I was fun to be around. Well, you know, I came in 2002 or 2001. Okay. And it was still very, they called us Yankees. Yeah, you know? oh yeah, yeah. They don't yeah. do that anymore. Or Northerners. Yeah, like there was yeah. a thing where it was like yeah. you were on the outside. Yeah, oh yeah. And it yeah. was like, we're going to yeah. allow you to be here, but exactly. watch your step and yes. make sure you, and I did yeah. that. But yeah. now it's like, that doesn't exist. Oh, right, right. I'm wondering what it was like back then. Was it even worse? Yeah, well, they, yeah, well the thing is, is that I got in with the right click. You know, Roddy and Roseanne were not... All right. You know, they, they had friends from all across the border, very liberal-minded people. Uh, so I, you know, I, I met a lot of people who, I met people from both coasts, for sure. Matter of fact, even when I came here, I met so many people from all over. When I met people, like, who's from, is some, one of you from here, from Nashville? No? But whenever I meet someone, you're from Nashville. Yeah. Like, when people say, oh, I'm from Nashville, like, really? You right, know, that, that's audit. what it was, you know? But it was definitely, you know, the, the, the food thing for me was, was rough. Oh, know? yeah. I couldn't get better, a good sandwich. Coming from New York, it was impossible or to bagel. really be okay with the food here. Yeah, yeah, it was rough. But it's got, it's, that's really changed. Forget about it. It's, yeah. But when we first moved here, my wife and I moved here, I think, 2005. Yeah, it was a right? lot better and by we traveled, then. I traveled down a bunch in 01 and 02 yeah. to make a couple records. And, yeah. And it was, the whole town has changed in, yeah. in that amount of time. Yeah. But there's still, there's still a music community. <clears throat> and the th other thing too, Joe, that I want to implore is that um, I, every time I speak to students, uh, you know, there, there's a, um, now like I said, I'm 61, so my, my work uh, is, has you know, subsided substantially because most of the people getting the work are like songwriters nowadays, especially in country music, the songwriter in some cases is the producer. And in some cases, he's even the engineer. So there's a lot of jobs that were leveled because of that, because, you know, and, and even in some cases, like, for instance, here, I don't know about you, I don't know if you need cartage, but some people don't even need cartage because no, we don't do cartage. they do everything themselves. And that's great. That's fine. Uh, but some people my age, uh, they, they despise the music. Uh, they, they don't have work and they bitch and moan about it but I'm accepting it because there's nothing I can do about it and I'm trying to learn the new music and I'm trying to learn the new ways. There's no way I'm gonna mix these pop records because I don't, I don't think that way. I don't think to have a synthesizer that I don't like louder than the lead vocal. I don't think to put reverb on a vocal that I think should be in your face. Mm -hmm. So, but I am ex I'm excited about trying it and I still wanna make, I still, young, I still feel young at heart. But what I want to implore to everyone is that you might get 
a side of, of, of us that people say, ah, oh, no, don't forget about it. It's not, nah, music business is over. You know, you're not gonna go anywhere. Bullshit. Your palette is, can't be wider than it is today yeah. because you can make music anywhere just like this. And some of it is good music. You right. know, when I say some of it, I mean, there's a lot of garbage out there and I don't like the sound of, of some of the records, but they're not made to last a lifetime, I don't think. I, no, I, you're I, right. You know, but, but what I'm saying to you is that you can make a record in your living room, shoot a quick YouTube video, and all of a sudden have like 10,000 hits. Right. So don't listen to what people say. Go with your heart. Music is absolutely necessary. People, like, did you see the video of Keith Urban in the hospital with that girl that's dying? Mm -hmm. They said that she was like night and day after he left. Mm -hmm. Music is really important to us and we still need to make it. So don't listen to anybody else. Listen to your heart and your soul and use your heart and your soul to make the music. Don't use presets and YouTube videos. All right, uh, how many people at this exact moment want to make a record with Steve Mark? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. It's when it's yeah, like uh, we, yeah, we, we're gonna make a record. You cannot hide. Yeah. You cannot hide that that passion. passion. I was just talking to Mike the other day on the porch, and I said it's almost to the, maybe it wasn't you, but I said it's almost to the point now where all the money grab folks have been washed out of the business. Yes. So we actually, you kind of know the people that are in it now. Mm -hmm. They're actually the legit guys. Right. They're doing it for the right reasons. Right. Because it right. isn't all that financially, it's not a smash and grab anymore. Yeah. You know, and it's like, when I hear a guy talk like that, I'm like, man, how do I get in the room and do mm. something creative with a guy like that? That's the guy I want to be yeah. in with. And well, it's you just, can, you can't fake that. Yeah, That's you got to have you passion. Love. And you know what, Joe, I don't know these guys, but I do know that they have passion. They Otherwise, are. they wouldn't be here. They're fantastic. Jack, I'm not sure about, but you know. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. He I was easy up. on all of you. I'm not gonna be easy on Jack. You're the youngest one, no doubt. Yeah. Did you have work today or were you off? I didn't have work today. Okay, so Jack was off today, he right? He showed up uh, on Yoko's schedule. An hour and a half. We usually have a bed in the studio for Jack. Uh, yeah. Where he just oh, okay. sits on a bed you, like a, with like a right. drapery. Uh, and, no, I, I read I, that I, Jeff Emmerich book. Oh, I, you know, and speaking of, of Jeff, you know, you asked me, you were, you're anxious to hear that I get along with John. Did you read Jeff's book? I mean, I think I read it. What was it called? It, um, here, There, and Everywhere? Was or? it Here, There, and Everywhere? It was something. No, it wasn't. That was, road or? I forget what it was, but you know, the, you know the book, you know the Jeff who we're talking about? So I, I had the, um, the luck to have met Jeff Emmerich at Blackbird and I got him to sign my book. And I read that book. Totally and cool. Maybe. <laughs> I read that book maybe in a couple days. Which Me is, too. And I wanted to read it again, and I read it with a smile because, yeah. but the thing is, when I read it, I saw that, unfortunately, uh, Jeff went through hell with John Lennon. He was really bad to him, right. and I can, I can see that. I can. You know, the one thing about that book that struck me as uncanny was like, he, would, he either had the best memory of anyone I've ever met, but he would say like, and then we listened to the playback of um, Come Together, and I remember John's button was his top <laughs> pen in his, like, yeah. and I was like, this is either totally cooked and not well, you know, know, something, manufactured, or he's got well, like that. Well, you know something, I have such vivid memory, I can understand that. I can totally understand because I have vivid memories of things I've done many years ago. I can't remember what I, when I first came in through that door, you know, it's like, I, 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 don't, I don't doubt that. But getting back with Jeff, I met him and I said, Jeff, I says, I want you to know that I, I worked with John. I was with him a week before he died. And I just want to let you know that he was a really, he was really nice to me and a really nice guy. And I thought he needed to hear that from me. Yeah. What did he say? He said, oh, thanks. You know, he was really surprised. He was nice to hear that. You know, it was, yeah. you know, when I told him, hey, I worked with John, it was like, wow, shit, you were with John. And so anyway, John McBride. That's, by the way, that'd be the first thing I said in any room I went into. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I work with John Lennon. By the way, I worked John Lennon in 1980. <laughs> but anyway, um, Jeff didn't listen to Love. You know this, the album Love by the Beatles where... Uh, uh, right, where they redid from, from they, yeah, Vegas. He didn't, want to, he didn't believe in that. Yeah. He thought it was bogus and all. But I thought it was at first too, but I love that. You know, the, the, everything they redid. So John says, hey, have you heard Day in the Life yet? You know, and, or no, John said, have you heard Day in the Life? And it, it wasn't a love record. It was a Surround. It was a 5-1. Okay. So I don't know who remixed that, but Jeff didn't. Jeff didn't because he's probably um, it was George a, Martin's kid. Right, right. So 
he was like, yeah, sure, I'll listen to it. I don't know if you've ever heard surround. I mean, I'm not a big fan of surround and the whole making of it, but when you listen back to that particular song was incredible. I got to listen to that with Jeff for the with, wow. for his first time. I was standing right next to him. That's, now, cool. that's success. That's cool. <laughs> um, I thought the interesting part from that book also was where Jeff Emmerich said, hey, if you really want to hear the Beatles records, as I, we intended them, listen to the mono. Mono. Yeah. He said, we spend all our time on the mono, and yeah. then we would do the stereo mixes. We just do them in yeah. one day. We just yeah. blow the whole record up. Yeah. And I thought that was hilarious because all we know are the stereo versions, which yeah. are great. But he said, if right. you want them, and I heard that they got all those mono ones from the your boy. My boy. Uh, from uh, Blackbird. Oh, really? The, he had the vinyl oh, pressings wow. of them. He was like one of the only oh. people to have pristine versions of the vinyl, mono vinyl Beatles records. John can fill up this barn with his Beatle memorabilia, with yeah. his albums. I saw it. He almost sold it to a Japanese company. I shouldn't talk more about it, but in, amazing. Yeah, so Japanese. supposedly John McBride, yeah. who was Blackbird, had like never played or pristine. Yeah. yeah. Still on the wrapper, yep. the original mono, which yeah. like nobody had, and like the butcher cover with right. The, oh, he's got plenty all of all this like in yeah. duplicate and triplicate. Yeah. So that when they needed to source those, yeah. it was my understanding that they sourced some yeah. of that stuff from John that they couldn't source anywhere else. And you know, when you listen to old records, like you know, we still there's bands out there that still aspire to make a record that sounds like Led Zeppelin. Oh yeah, and they can't. And you know, I don't know if you realize this, but I remember when that first record came out. It was '69, so that meant that they either did that record and early 69 or late 68. And, you know, forget about it. Yeah. But the Beatle records though, that was done even in the early 60s. You know, you listen to them now and it's like, right. were they lucky? Was it a mistake? Was it, you know, what? But how much of those records are the limitation of the gear, the tape machines, the yes, mic freeze? Yes, exactly. You know, and you wonder, it's like, okay, but then they took and they made lemonade, you know, Jeff Emmerich would take it and you'd like the Tom sound and come together, it's like, Right. How did right. you get that Tom sound? Or how do you get it? I don't. I, I still what cannot was fathom. The, what was the record? Turn on your life. Oh, uh, um. Is not the uh, yeah, that's the psychedelic the one. Um, where they had the tape loops. Yeah. They had these yeah, tape yeah, loops yeah. of people laughing and whatever, and they were mixing them in during the record. You know. Yeah. Um, I wish, uh, come on, that was. Um, turn on your life, relax, and float downstream. Yeah. Here, da, um, da, da, da. yeah, 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 it is, it's not, yeah. da, 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 da. A couple things I want to get before we, before I forget, um, uh, talking about making those records and, and the ingenuity back then. Uh, Tom Dowd, do you know who Tom Dowd is? And have you seen his video? Okay, Tom Dowd uh, worked in the, in the 60s with um, Atlantic Records, and back then it was all black artists. Um, uh, was it Aretha? I think she might have yeah, been she was Atlantic, on Atlantic, but uh, they had a lot of jazz artists and he would do like, you know, car commercials in the morning and jazz at night and he did everything for Atlantic. But before then he was at a college and he was uh, studying to be a nuclear physicist and he went on to work on the Manhattan Project. Did you know that? Oh, I did not know the that. The Manhattan Project is when they made the atom bomb. He was a member of that team. And he just and got, a record producer and engineer. Well, after that, he became an engineer and producer. Yeah, but he's got. There's a, a documentary on him that you have to watch because you talk about passion. Is it on Netflix? I, I don't know where you know it's, it's on, called? but if you, I, I don't know the name of it. Um, but he talks about like I was just talking. To, I have a student from Belmont. Yesterday, I was telling him about the slide guitar on Layla. Do we all know Layla? Jack, you know the song Layla. See that Maybe. right? Now, I'm not so, trying. I'm not trying to embarrass you, no, but okay. but it's. I was saying how uh, I was surprised. It's a Britney Spears people, song. Uh, it, it's probably one of the most epic they rock songs. The, there's two versions of it. There's two. Oh, yeah. There's a beginning I, and yeah, an ending. Eric Clapton. Yeah. A lot of story about that song. Like the, the the drummer played the piano part and later killed his mother with a hammer and still in jail. But anyway. Um, yeah. Dwayne Allman played on that record. So there's Dwayne Allman and Eric Clapton, and Dwayne's playing the slide, and it's real high stuff. And, and Tom Dow was saying, you know, he's bringing up the tracks of Layla. He's going, I mean, listen to that. He goes, those notes aren't on the fret. You know, and I'm getting chills just hearing that too, because, you know, he was talking about it almost crying. You know, you talk about my passion. That, I learned it from people like that. You know, it's like, you have to be passionate about music and about what we do. It's like, you know, when you put up the drum mics and you, even like just like a simple Tom, you know, you, you put up that mic and you come over here and you listen and you go, oh yeah, perfect. Don't touch it, you know, it's like, 
that's passion. You know, er, you should be passionate about everything in making your, your record, for sure. Can I ask you a technical question? Yes. All right, because I love the stories, but now that you, you've worked on the, all these old records that whenever they came back up off the machine, they kind of felt like a, like a old record already because right. they were coming off old Ampex machines through old Trident consoles mm -hmm. or Neve consoles. So now when you're working in the box, what are you doing? Are you noticing all of the, of the stuff that's not taken away by tape and all the random harmonic content in records because of they're captured digitally? And how are you adjusting? Are you adjusting? What well, are you doing? Well, he, here's what I'll say about that. Uh, you know, we're analog all of a sudden. I don't, know, I don't know if it's a fad or not, but people, you know, a lot of young kids like Jack is thinking, let's, let's do an analog. That'll be cool, you know, and it's like the process of analog. Is the tape machine aligned properly? Is the tape okay? That roll of tape is $300, too. No, you're probably recording on re-recorded tape, so it's not really quite the true analog that we're used to. But it sounds better, right? It does, you know, you can listen to analog tape constantly and won't wear on your ears like digital will. Having said that, I think digital has come a long way, and as long as, in my opinion, as long as your front end is through some really cool analog gear, it, it good. should sound fine. I mean, I'm working on a track right now. Um, I, I strive for bottom end and thickness. I like things to be big and thick. So I do use some of the plugins I do use. Is it exactly like the, 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 the actual unit? It, it's, it's pretty close. You know, like the Pultec, adding 10K. Yeah, that, that sounds like what I remember Pultec sounding. If you have four Pultecs in the room and you add, right. if you go to the number four on each one of them, it's gonna they'll be all be different. But all 48 of my Pultecs are exactly the same. And I think I, like, I know enough to know when, when to use it, when not to use it. The same thing with all these emulations, like Slate makes the channel strip or the, you know, the, emulates the different consoles. And a lot of what we do, in making the record, we, we listen very intensely, and a lot of times the difference is like this. But there might be a lot of changes like this that make this, mm, you know? Good point. And the other thing too is, you have to learn to hear as an engineer. You know, you're listening to a song, oh, let me just turn up the trebles to make it sound brighter, or you're in your car, yeah, let me turn up that bottom end. Well, that bottom end, yeah, but you're adding like 350 you need about 180 in this car or 60, you know what I mean? It's like you have to train your ears to, his, to listen properly. And what is properly? What I mean by that is like, you have to train your ears to listen as an engineer so that you know, all right, the acoustics sound, uh, the, the, the mix sounds a little thick. Well, you know those acoustics, if I dip a little 60 hertz out of that and clean up this, oh, there you go. Like sometimes taking away EQ is better than just adding EQ, subtracting And EQ. like what you're also saying, EQing something in your guitars when all of a sudden your drum kit sounds better. Yes, exactly. I, that's what I took yes. from what you just said, which is mm -hmm. like, which was something that always surprised me. It's like, holy right. cow, I can't believe the difference in my, yeah. I worked on my bass, bass guitar and my kick drums are totally different. Right. All the issues I have with my kick drums gone. Yes, yes, exactly. Which is a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And, and um, wow, there's so much I want to say and I don't want to miss anything. I, I, I'm on a tangent here. So you were talking about how does it sound in here and I'm, I'm used to it now. And I do add, like for instance, the UA Oxide, have you heard of, you don't use any UA stuff, why is that? I think they make the best plugins. They make the most realistic plugins. You know, I, the logistics of the hardware for me yeah. was an issue, and I didn't want to get not on, You're not on Thunderbolt? No, I'm on Thunderbolt, okay. but like adding more hardware, it's like how many more 1176s do I need? Are you on HDX? Don't you need like a core? Are you on HDX? Yeah, I'm on HDX. Well, yeah, you need a card. <laughs> yeah, hardware, <laughs> they call it hardware. Yeah, I'm just like, I'm sick. I, I think that every piece of gear you needed to make a record was made by 1975. So right, 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 right. right. I get overwhelmed with it's yeah. like, hey, here's another Apple. Try yeah. my Granny Smith Apple. Right, but right, this is a right. facsimile of this. Right. So part of me is just like, screw it. They made great records in 1975. Well, I all mean, I got to do is there, there are you know like I get overwhelmed. You can get you, uh, Wave makes a lot of great plugins, and and also like what makes one plugin better than the other? It's just it's your personal opinion. I think. I mean, yeah. even the Avid plugins, the EQ that comes with their compressors, it's great. fine. Um, I wanted to mention a few plugins too while I'm here because I, I, I came prepared for the class. Are you doing anything on your own at home and stuff? Good. Um, but uh, so I have this. Um, I, I let a Blackbird student mix a project for me because there was not much money in it. So I told the artist, I said, hey, listen, 
this Blackbird student who just graduated is really good. She's a young girl. I said, why don't you have her mix it? It's a great story. You're a female artist letting this young girl from Blackbird Academy, so on and so forth. I do nice things. That's, that's my story of my life. But, that's so, why I've been hanging out with him. He's yet to give me one of these kids. So I, I was overlooking the mixes. You know what I mean? I wanted to make sure, because I had mixed this girl's last record. So this one particular song, we, I was at Blackbird listening to her. She's, in the, in the, uh, she's on a laptop, so she has limited plugins and limited space. So this one particular guitar, <clears throat> uh, and I knew the stuff sounded good because I heard the tracks. So I knew it went down okay. <clears throat> so this one guitar, I said, you know what, I think that can use just a little less low end on that guitar. She said, yeah, that guitar, and she, the, the cute little Chinese girl, so the, the um, artist or the engineer. The, the engineer. So the communication was a little slow. Uh, and she says, you know, I, I had trouble with that because I didn't like the sound of it. I said, okay, let's see what you got. And I, she starts, she had five plugins on. I said, let's bypass them all. And what you know, the guitar sounded amazing. I says, you, you don't need that. You know, she was trying yeah. to impress me. And if, and the crux of this story is that, and I tell all my students that, to get a good mix, you have to have good tracks in there. It's gotta sound good. When I mix my tracks, there might be, like the vocal might have the most plugins, but across the board, there's two, maybe three plugins on the sum of them. So I rely on what I put into it. And I always like to make sure, I like my track sounding thicker rather than thinner. I'd rather have to thin it out in mixing, so I wouldn't even mind recording a lot of things close to flat, minimal EQ. So, and well, I like we, We've I, been talking about yes. like having the courage to back out of bad decisions. Right. It's like there was a point where it's like, okay, I went through this chain, that's got an, I've got an issue with that, I'm going to fix it with this next, next plugin. Well, that made it do this thing, right. I'm going to fix it. And next thing you know, you're down the road and you're like, wait a minute, why don't I just go back to the beginning back, yes. and reassess? Yes. And I find that whenever I do that, I'm always saying, hey, you know what? I can get rid of 60% of this stuff that it, I'm doing. Exactly. And when I'm EQing something, I was telling the guys that I'll EQ something and I'll immediately say, now that I got rid of that mud, I need to get rid of this annoying frequency in the mid-range. And I'm... Every step is adding more EQ. Right. So I try to compress EQ, mm -hmm. dynamically EQ. Right. So, you know, half of it is having the good, the good sense to back out of a, not saying, hey, well, I put it on there, it's on there. Just back out of, yeah. consider your decisions. Less yeah, is more. If you are mixing, there's a few things to consider. Obviously, the speakers you use and just to get used to them. If you're used to them and you like them, don't buy other ones, even if you have Radio Shock speakers. If you're used to them, stay. Uh, try to listen to a couple different sets of speakers. I have a radio, a, a boom box at home, and I also have a Bluetooth speaker. And um, I listen every once in a while mono. Try to listen at a medium level. If you listen loud, there's a chart somewhere. And I also have an SPL meter. I check and see how loud I'm listening. I might listen to, like if you're listening at 90 dB, which is pretty hefty, there's a chart, I forget how to look it up or something. Doubles every... Well, like if you're listening at 90 dB, they say, after about 15 minutes, you should stop or take a break or something like mm -hmm. that. But it's important to take breaks. But it's an exponential scale. So for yeah. ev from 90 to 95, it apparently doubles the exactly. level. Something yes. like that. Yes, yes. But, and, and the other thing too is, if you're working late at night, there comes a point of no return. So just step away, go to bed, and you'll find when, like with me, you know, my, a lot of top end, bottom end, whatever goes away, and my, the next day I come in, I go, yeah, instead of getting rid of 8 dB at 100, let me just get rid of one and a half dB. Well, and this you know? goes to, we talked about this the <laughs> other week too. It's like a lot of times I had a head cold and I tracked a record and I was able to track that record with my ears shut down because I knew the meters. Levels. And that's, I knew the levels are right. And then I was like, I can deal with this. And it sounded great. Nico later. Bowl has told me the same story. But once you start like, hey, wait a minute. You have to ask yourself a question. Why am I pulling out 8 dB at 100 hertz? That right, seems right. weird. Yeah. This is like some of, something yeah. that right here. Yeah. Listen to... Once yeah. you do 10 records, you'll know this, yeah. you know? And you can essentially, I had both my station tubes knocked, the com compressed down and two full ears full of fluid. I was able to track this record yeah. and come back and, and, and make it sound like a real record. Yeah, watch your meters. You know, you don't have to put a lot of level in Pro Tools these days. And I, uh, you know, I always think of Pro Tools as the tape machine and the console. So when I'm mixing on a console, you know, it's good to have those faders up at least halfway up the fader, if not more than that, to push the console. So if you're recording a bass guitar and the level is going up to here, like up to here, that means if you put a fader on there, 
It, you bring up the fader just this much and there'll be enough bass. And I don't know about you, but a lot of times when I get stuff to mix, I, I play this song and I'll listen to it and I can just look at some of the waveforms and go, wow, that's way too much level. I use clip gain. Do you use clip gain? Oh yeah, all the time. I use, I, and I've been using that whenever like, someone just told me that they recorded a vocal, it was, oh, it was Jeff from Chicago. <coughs> He's doing this really great Led Zeppelin-esque rock band in Chicago. And he said he, was, he recorded the vocal was super soft and super loud. I said, well, make sure you use clip gain when you do that, because that way, if you're using that with a fader, your compressor's yes. gonna be one dB of compression and then 20 yeah. dB. If you use clip gain, it will hit the compressor, yeah. so you have 15 dB of compression on the soft. And, yeah. It's a better way I to do it. I hadn't it. been doing that until the most recent version. I, when I'm mixing a song, my vocals, I always clip gain. The minuscule amount sometimes. I'll bring some stuff up, some breaths or some ends of words. But the bass guitar is the main culprit because if you're mixing, if you're just recording digitally, you know, you see the bass, you know, you want it, you know, oh man, I better get the bass up to about here. But even up here might be pretty hot. You know what I mean? Yeah. So when you put a plug in on something where there's a lot of level, it's going to react very quickly. Also, when you use plugins, especially a certain engineer from a mixer from California, whose name I won't mention, CLA, um, his plugins, when you put them in, they're immediately at least 5 dB hotter. Yeah. And I don't, you know, the thing, the thing about level, you know, two of you can do the same mix and yours could sound better than his, but his might be 5 dB hotter. We're all going to like his better because right. yours is lower. Since you told me you're down about the plugins, every yes. plugin I open now, it's like... So, well, I get why they do it, but it's disingenuous yeah. and it goes against their credibility. It's like, we get it. You want us to like it with your plugin in rather than off. But the reality is level is like, level will win every time. Yeah. yeah. Slate actually has started doing this uh, 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 noise match or uh, level match. I so, love the ozone plugin for that because yeah. you could do your ozone stuff, right? What is it, level match? So that, so that the 5 dB increase doesn't happen? Oh. So like on oh, Ozone, once you do your programming, you can say match level, and you can go in between it, you can hear the ex it's the exact same loudness. Gotcha. You can hear what Ozone's doing, and there's no level. Yeah. I like right. Ozone, yeah. I like Ozone because whenever I'm an island to myself, if I'm a songwriter, I play all the instruments on it, and then I record it, then I mix it, yeah. I mean, what perspective do I have? I can hit a button, and they'll say, hey, what do you think, Ozone? And right, right. It'll kind of master yeah. it for me. I'm like, oh, thank you, Ozone, or whatever. Yeah. It gives me something to have an opinion yeah. about. Um, yeah, every once in a while, like if you're working on a sound, always go in and out, in and out, because, and, and I remember as an assistant, we didn't have insert buttons on the patch bay, so you oh, have yeah. to pull the patch, <laughs> all right, in, out, in, out, and the one, the one console we had was a Spectrosonics console, it wasn't modular, so the desk actually flipped open to check all the components inside, and the patch bay were double-pronged. And I'm, I'm not exaggerating, the patch bay was about from here to here, about this wide, and double pronged so that the patch cords had a ribbed edge on one side, which meant that that went on the right for a phase. So these were quarter inch patch They bays? were quarter inch. Yeah. And guess who had to clean them when they first started working? There? Yeah, because they were all brass, right? I've done clean, that with a screwdriver and a rag. patch cords is not fun. But, but not the patch cords, the patch bay. You talk oh, about the no, patch cords. I used to See, I would have to take a rag oh, and never, go in the... Never had to do that. But, you know, it was, you know when, the, when the engineer said, uh, let, me, let me check that, you know, go in and out. And that's where I learned, you know, what is it? I guess it's Unity Game, right? Is that part That's of what it? you're looking yeah. for, to, for yeah. a reference, but yeah. And the other thing, too, I remember patching, like, you know, especially on the, in Studio A on that Spectrosonics, you know, the, producer, the engineer would say, Hey, let's put a telly and a pull tech. That's all I heard. That's all you heard in, in New York. Telly pull tech, which means a teletronics limiter and a pull tech EQ. That was the chain for almost every sound. That, all vocals, you know, maybe guitars. But if the engineer said, you know what, before the, the EQ, let's put this other, you know, noise gate or something. So that meant that you had to come out of the compressor into the gate first, then into the EQ, back into the insert return, okay? That's, not, that's easy, right? No, it's not when you have a mound of patch cords and you also have to remember, oh, what am I, you know, I'm, you know and it's easy to, if you think about it, you have one patch cable in your hand and you should be able to just do it easily. But back in the day, it was pretty, and then if the engineer says, let's try the EQ first, then you have to redo all, whereas here, it's very easy to do, mm -hmm. so. I wanted to mention a few, um, Plugins, real quick, because I'm really, really excited about them. You've got one of them, um, the Omni Channel. Mm -hmm. 
Who, who's that boy? The Sheps okay. Omni Channel. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, Joe has it here, and I just real quickly wanted to do this. Um, it's, you know, I use it almost now on every channel. It's, it's my, you know, it's my uh, channel strip. Uh-oh. Wheel of waiting. Am I going to? Oh, OK. So you know that you can move all these modules around, right? Mm -hmm. You know? I, I like to keep it, uh, I like to put this guy at the end, and I put the compressor before the EQ. <laughs> And then, of course, you know in here, there, you can put other plugins. They're all Wave plugins, which, oh, he's got them all. That's great. But the thing about this plugin, it's got a saturation knob, and it's great. And you can, you know, you can put it on heavy and use thump and, you know, plus two, plus four. The filters are here, but the noise gate is great. And here's the thing, too. I don't know if, does that, does, do you use this plugin? Yeah. Did you know that you can focus on everyone by hitting this button here, right? And that brings it up yeah. to here. This noise gate is tremendous. It's really good because you can get really fine tuned in there. And the other thing too is this compressor is great too. I don't know what they're modeled after, but there's, uh, where, where is it here? Oh, right here. FET and Opto and VCA. But all I know is that when I do this to a certain thing and I hear it, I know when it sounds good. And, the best thing, too, is the mix knob. That works good. Uh, the other thing, too, that I just learned the other day. OK, now here's a, a nice, oh boy, what happened? So you know, if, you're, if, you're have, if you have a stereo sound and you want to go in and out on, on, on phase, there's no way of linking these two, right? I mean, you link them this way, but that's just the faders. I just found out how to do this. You hit the Shift button, and you press one here and one here. And, oh, wait a second. Here, let's do this again. So, boom and boom. And now, they're very grouped. Gabish? Gabish. Anyway, this is a great, great um, plugin. I love it. The other plugin, too, that I wanted to talk to you about. Oh, do you, ha do you have the new uh, EMI mastering? No. OK. The new EMI mastering uh, console. Is tremendous. That's what I've heard. You know, there's a million inserts. Jeff's million been presets. using it. The guy in Chicago has been using it, and okay. it's the most drastic difference between the two mix and his master. Okay, the version. Weiss. Have you heard of the Weiss yeah. plugin? I have that, and I've been using that even for mixing. I don't use it drastically, but it just it lifts your mix up that much, you know. Uh, this, I remember the Weiss analog stuff. So oh, really? I, I don't know. They have. Oh, they have a great plugin, great mastering plugin. But now with this EMI. Um, uh, I think so, yes, I think it is, yeah. But this EMI uh, mastering thing, I just, I used it and I started messing around with it and I'm telling you, I changed things this much and it was unbelievable. I got a picture I, of it, the, a PDF that he sent over to show me. And I saw the video of it too and guys from Abbey Road were there. Yeah, Jeff Stovall? Is that Jeff Stovall? Uh-uh. Stovall? No. Here it is. This is the mastering plugin. Yeah. That's Abbey Road. It yeah. Is. It's tremendous. Really, really good. This part of the Abbey Road. Highly plugin. recommend. And you know, it's you know, Waves has almost given away their plugins. You know, they're so cheap. Yeah. I think that one was sixty nine. Thirty nine. Thirty nine. Thirty nine. <laughs> okay. But there's one other plugin that I'll leave you with this. I uh, my friend Wookie turned me on to it. I forget the name of the company that makes it, but it's called Auto Align. Sound Radex. Sound Radex. Radex. What does okay. it do? It's, okay. It's like you're. It's like you're in phase from waves. Oh. Only, it's, yeah. Did you watch the video? I I, I use it a lot. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So cool. what it does is, first of all, I downloaded the the demo. Check this out. And this is the way I ride too. I fly rather. Uh, I, I downloaded the demo. Right here. Auto tune. Auto align. I downloaded a demo, and I'm not real computer savvy, so there's times that I don't know what I'm doing as far as downloading and upgrading and uploading, whatever. Uh -huh. But I knew I downloaded the plugin, I saw it in my computer, but it wasn't in my iLock, and I couldn't get it to happen. So I 
emailed the company and, and told them what was going on. Long story short. Did you bring short, up the John Lennon thing? <laughs> long story short, and the great comeback, whenever anybody says long story short, you say too late. Because if they say long story short, you've already made a long story short. Yeah. They emailed me back and said, let us know a time to get a hold of you. We'll take over your screen and take care of it. And that's what they did. Wow. I bought the plugin, just based on that alone, because I, I thought to myself, well, that's cool. Okay, so I have, I do record a lot of tracks on drums, only because I do them for, for other clients and I know that they want to. I got, you know, two kick drum mics in and out, two snare drum, you know, it's top and bottom, overheads, a mono room, a stereo room, a GAC mic, whatever. And, and, and always, when I'm tracking, you know, you know when you bring up your overheads, I always start my overheads, because Russ Kunkel taught me that. That's a, I dropped that name, too. Because he says that your drums, your overhead should be a picture of your, of your drums. But when you bring up your snare, obviously, you're over, when you flip the overheads on your snare, your snare gets nice and full, but then your kick might be out of phase, and blah, 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 so on and so forth. So what this auto line does is, and oddly enough, they say to start with the left yeah, overhead, yeah. which is closer to the snare. So you take this plug-in on, you put it on your left overhead, and you send that as the send, and everything else received, the kick, the snare. Um, basically, it looks at that on the, on the waveform of that overhead, and it syncs it up with that. And I went through, I'm telling you, I went through and I did one by one, just like the videos. I guess that's the way to, what you have to do is you have to, you hit play, so the overhead, the overhead is up there and you have the plug-in on that and then you go to the other overhead or the kick drum mic. You go to the other overhead first and you'll find out that that other overhead is maybe two or three samples off. But the kick drum is 56 samples off. And the snare drum is 120 samples off. As I'm listening to it, doing it, I hear it getting in like this, and all of a sudden the whole kit is going through it, and sure enough, I hit play, and then I get all of them, and I go and bypass. Big difference, huge hmm. difference. Waves as a plug. But I thought that that was uh, the phase relationship between those mics is half of what makes it. Does it get really mono on you? No, oh, not at all, not at all. I and you know what? I, you I will say that I, I remember listening to a Big Ben years ago. That that uh, clock. Yeah. Yeah, the empty clock. And that did it for me, too. Listening to the Big Ben versus no Big Ben, when you have two or three I IOs, but I don't, I just have one IO, so I don't need a clock, correct? Well, it's got a clock. You could right. clock it to whatever. But right. Yeah. But this plugin definitely takes all, you know, there, it's hard to describe sound, you know what I mean? But it definitely, it takes that drum kit, and of course, it's full and mighty and stuff like that, but it just adds that much more punch and that much more focus. To I'd it. love to hear you. I'd what love to give you. I think it's just like an energy thing. I felt like it didn't lose power. It actually right. centered. Did getting, you do, did you, have you taken, I, yeah. if I'm correct, I almost wired. Yeah. Have you taken drums from here and done it? I have, but I haven't shared. You know what? You can okay, spend a whole, it. you know, it, it, it doesn't matter who recorded it or where or whatever. And it's not something like, for instance, they say don't do it on your room mics because your room mics you want to be, they're right. not necessarily out of phase, but you know, you yeah. don't want to drag your room mics into the same thing as the snare. I'm not saying that right, it would physically it would bring move it. it, right. But the other thing too that he did was he said don't align, align the kick in and the snare top to it, but then your kick out, align that with your kick in, which is already aligned to your overhead. Your overhead. Okay. You dig? Your snare bottom, oh, align that to your snare top. This is a whole story. Like, you have to really watch the video. It to takes get this. about, oh, you have to, I watched the video and it's a great video. The guy, the guy made a few mistakes and he printed over and said, I didn't mean to say that because instead of redoing the video, you right. know what I mean? But I gotta it's see worthwhile. This. I'd and, love to see and it. it. And it took me to do a whole drum track. I recently it used the Waves one yeah. and I, there was, I was hearing some weird phase and some okay, overheads. It's worth and whenever it. I did it, I was like, I actually backed out of it because yeah. it was like, it was. Go there and, and download the demo. I hope you get it okay. It costs $150, but like I said, the, the service they Isn't gave that funny? me. It's like the gear we used to buy was like, I know. I it was like 10 grand for one reverb. It was like an RMX was 10 grand and okay. it was like, it was a reverb. Do you know what a like 250, EMT 250, you know what they are? They call them R2D2, those big red things, yeah. right? They're plates, but they weren't real plates. Okay. Oh, okay. I worked with Mike Chapman. I doubt you would know who, I hope you know who Mike Chapman is. I know. He, mm -hmm. he, he worked with a guy named Nick Chin many years ago, Chinny Chap Productions. Oh yeah, he, wrote he did all the Blondie. Ballroom Blitz, yeah, yes, he wrote yes. Ballroom Blitz, Blondie, The Knack. Right. Um, 
I got to work with him, by far the best producer. He had two EMT 350s. Yeah. Back then, guess how much they were? 15, 20 grand? 18,000. Yeah. And then he needed the case for them. But Mike was making They money. had one, of, you remember, do you remember Room of the View? On Fifth Avenue. No. They had a, they had, they called it the R2-D2. It was this little, yeah, R2-D2, it yeah. looked so ganky. It was and like I this will little, say, you know, and it was a plate, but it wasn't a, was it a real plate in there? Or was it digital? Yeah, I, well, it was a digital plate. I don't think it made noise. Right, I don't there. think it was no. an actual, we were talking and about. And you know, did you ever use that for anything other than reverb? Uh -uh, like because the, the delay is really cool. Robin Zander from Cheap Trick, that's what he likes to use. I just dropped another name. Maybe <laughs> one of the best vocalists I've ever worked with. Anyway. The point is you're spending 20 grand on a piece of gear and now it's like we say, what's really pricey? It's 150, but you can only use it on every channel. Right, but you can have 150 you know. for 20 of them, you know, and I do use it and it does sound. Nico Bolas, who is down on a lot of things, he heard it and says, no, that's the real deal. I mean, it's yeah. not like, I listen to Nico Bolas, but you know, you know Nico Bolas is. All right, well, well, cool. I, I don't mean, want to, you, know, you have any questions? It's two hours. Does anybody I mean, have any questions? I have two questions. Okay. They're part of the same gift. When is the mix finished for you? And secondly, how much headroom do you put on your? Well, those are two incredible questions. Okay. <laughs> it's funny you should say that, Mike, because I remember. I, I don't want to say back in the day, but. We rarely remixed anything. And when something was remixed, guess what? They remixed it. I never documented a mix in my life. So it was always remixed. So when the mix was done, there, there wasn't, except for Clive Davis, no one from a label, or maybe John uh, Kalodner, no one said, hey, remix that song. Especially like a band like Jay Giles, you wouldn't tell them to remix a song. When, is, when do you know it's over? We, nowadays we don't because it's not just the producer and the artist. It's the A&R person. The it's, it's the publisher. It's the husband or wife of the artist. And they know what can be done. So even though you've brought the song in and mastered it, they'll say, you know what? That in, we're having trouble still in that second verse. We can't hear enough vocal. So you have to bring up the mix. And that's the only drag about the, the, the world we live in now is the, the options are, are bountiful. So you spend more time recording more so that there's more options in the end, and then you sp spend more time making one decision, but knowing, oh, but knowing there's still more, so it's kind of hard. And the other thing, too, is about every year the AES uh, does this mix contest with the schools in town. You might want to get involved in that, you know. You might be able to get involved in that. And they have judges, and one of the things they judge on is mastering. And I always allow, I mean, I don't know, I don't know in DB or something, but I keep an eye, like Joe said, on my meters. I can almost mix a song looking at meters, but I, I try not to get it, you know, I, I definitely want to keep my dynamics. And that's the thing too, I, I think we're almost over the, the volume wars, yeah. but I remember talking to this one particular engineer in town, bragging about, yeah, I didn't have to master mine, you know, you know yeah, because no one can master it because there was too much level. Right. So um, you have to be cognizant of that. And that's the thing is like, I, I don't know about you, Joe, but whenever I send a mix out to listen to, I make sure that it's like pre-mastered. And there's one guy in town, Andrew Mendelson, do you ever use him? He always yeah, wants, time. yeah, he always wants a copy of that mix, whatever you did to play for the client. Because nowadays when you play your mix for people, if it doesn't sound mastered, or if they're listening in their, in their car radio and they listen to your mix, once again, your mix is not mastered, you're not mastered so there, there's, there's gonna be a little bit more room for more volume. But when they're listening and they go, well, let me compare it to this CD. Let right. me put the CD, oh wait, you know. So you have to kind of fool them with some pre-mastering. And that's, that's kind of a drag. But I always like to leave enough for the mastering engineer to pull up volume or whatever, so I'm very cognizant of that. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I know you've worked with many great bands, but uh, what was it like working with Joe Piscopo, the comedian? A and blast. Yeah. That's back when he was funny. You know, <laughs> the producer of the Blues Brothers, after he stopped producing records, got a job producing Saturday Night Live. Um, and actually, he didn't produce, Joe Piscopo was produced by a guy named Rick Chertoff, who was with Arista at the time. He produced Cindy Lauper and the Hooters. So the, I remember that I remember. session. So you knew I worked with Joe? Uh, I looked at, yeah, 
How do you know that? You, it was it was on. It was, it was on a list of all. Okay, favorites. so Joe did this medley of Frank Sinatra's of of rock songs like I Love Rock and Roll, um, um, Cold as Ice, uh, <laughs> I Under My that. Thumb, uh, uh, Born to Run, all as Frank Sinatra, and it was interesting because. It was with all Yo Cats from New York. I think it was mostly the Saturday Night Live band and then horn players, string players. And we had to come up with a, um, a, a, uh, an arrangement. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard it, but it, it's pretty funny. But it, it, it was a blast. And then I remember mixing it and we had to release a B-side. So we just did the, mu we played the music and he spoke as Frank Sinatra. Yeah. But I, I got to know Joe and I got to go see Saturday Night Live a couple times. And have you ever been? Mm -mm. You know, you got to wait online. You know, you get tickets, you get brought in, you get put in there. And Eddie Murphy at the time was there. So he came out before the show just to get the crowd loosened up and livened up. And it was a blast. But before the show, you see that some of the cast walk around. So I'm sitting there and I see Joe and say, <coughs> yo, Joe, like that. And, and hey, Steve, how you doing? And I'm sitting there. It's like, yeah, I don't know. So it was a gas. It was a blast working with Joe. Yeah. And he was a Jersey boy. But uh, yeah. The album was named New Jersey. Oh, was it? But I didn't work on the album. I just worked on that one segment. Uh, have you heard that medley? Some of them. Oh, man. It's, you know. Yeah, I remember that. Oh, yeah. Oh, you do remember that. Yeah. I remember that exact And thing. a lot of the stuff he did, like he did um, I Love Rock and Roll and, and Born to Run. Well, Born to One wasn't recorded at Record Plant, but, but that album was recorded there. And uh, Joan Jett recorded that song in the same song in the same room we did that Joe Piscopo. I love oh, Ron wow. Walsh. That was, all, that. that was all Jimmy Iveen, wasn't it? No, uh, no. Mike Joan Capel. Jett was um, Joan Jett was uh, what's his name? Her manager. Uh, it's not. No, was it Richard Goddard? I don't no, know. Um, her her manager. Uh, shit, what's his name? And Tom Panunzio did those records. Tom's working with Joan now. She's Born to a, Run was done by Appel, Mike Capel, right? Mike. No, no. Well, Mike Capel, yes, and. The other guy, that's his manager now. He co-produced it with Mike. Mm -hmm. I can't remember his John name. Landau. John Landau, yeah. What's, right. the, what's the record I'm thinking of for Born to Run where they spent like three weeks on drums? Four weeks on drums or something. Jimmy Iveen nearly well, like Jimmy, uh, Well, Jimmy did uh, 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 Born to Run. He, as a matter of fact, the story goes is that Bruce was at Sony Studios and Jimmy came in and poured Coke on the console and said, there's a problem, let's go back to the record plant. <laughs> and Jimmy didn't record or mix Born to Run. Uh, Lou Lahav did it. But he recorded the rest of it. I don't know about the drum thing. No, that wasn't that. That was the one he did Tom Petty. Yeah, because I read that book, Mansion on the Hill, and I don't remember that I, them talking about Jimmy Iovine for Born to Run, but maybe I'm wrong. It was a HBO documentary uh, with uh, Iovine and Dr. Dre. It's a, like a three part series. That's yeah. phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that. Well, and he him, talks. Him and Bruce, you know, like, really did uh, Yeah. Yeah, it was Tom Petty when, when they did, uh, yeah, because it was, yeah, what's his name? Peter. Yeah, when uh, Stan Lynch, mm -hmm. he's in the, in, the video, in the movie, he said, uh, Jimmy came out and said some things. He goes, hey, Jimmy, you see that glass over there? On the other side, that's where you belong, you know? <laughs> but I don't know, Jimmy might have mentioned, maybe, maybe it was on Darkness, but Bruce was definitely known to um, start a song and then say, well, give me a minute, and he would go to the piano for eight hours and rewrite the song, or he would cut the song in different tempos different keys and stuff like that so maybe but they did spend days getting drum sounds back in those days for sure you know I, I did tracks on a demo the other day over at soundstage when we had a blackout so it was a two o'clock session and oh yeah a, I saw you posted something did you, you said you that? were screaming at somebody you see, you a certain guitar Rowe player is? yeah have you ever worked with him yeah he's ridiculously good he recorded that and, and oh, that's funny. put it on Instagram I'm in there yelling at the guitar player. because Who was, was the guitar player? Tom Bugovac. Oh, please. But I got sounds in about 20 minutes on that drum sounds, and the producer gave me the tracks today to get some rough mixes. I listened back. I was like, man, these sound great. Everything sounded really good. And I brought up yeah. my rough mix in the box, and all my faders were at least halfway up. The master fader, the volume was still, I still had room. So I was like, yeah, I got some good level. I like level. I like getting good levels. Matter of fact, when I'm tracking and I have my, my balance up and I look at my stereo mix and I'm hitting zeros, I'm going, I got good level. <laughs> I did a session a while ago at, at Starstruck and I'm over there and I'm like, man, these sound good. And my assistant was like, 
you're the only guy I, I know with who really likes, who, who's into their own tracks, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know but, uh, yeah. You know, I've never cared for, what's, tell us some of your favorite studios in Nashville. Well, uh, Blackbird, I've, I've, I've come to really love. Blackbird. You know, I've never been inside that place. Are you? I've been in the rental department. You know, you would, they need to have you at their academy. Do you know Mark Rebell? Uh-uh, but I'd you, love to, if you would you, take you me in there, I'd love to take a little also, tour of it. And also, they should come here. And vice versa, maybe you could I'd love take your guys there one day. We'd love that. They would love it. They've got two tracking rooms. Studio A is, excuse me, they added on the building to, their, to the original studio. The room has a Neve console in it, which they like to brag was either a Steely Dan or The Who recorded there, which, by the way, when people say that, it means nothing anymore. Um, but, but you know, that, I know that console. I, it used to be at River Sound, okay, Donald Fagan's okay. place. There you go, yeah. 8078. So, and when you look out, the, stu the original studio is there, but that original studio now is just a piano booth. You know, the piano is sitting there, and then the room is to the side. And it's tall ceilings, and he's got these pipes that, that with a, a, a switch come all the way down, and he's got stands on there where you can put power supplies for, for tube mics even. So you could put room mics way up high, and he's got a chamber that leads out to the, to the parking lot, and the chamber has a, a ceiling that comes down. Wow. And I bring that sucker down to about maybe 12 feet, and I put my drums on the opposite side, and I put a stereo AEA in there, and it's happening. And sometimes what I'll do, this is a trick that I like to tell my students, if I get like a chamber like that in there, I'll take a snare and maybe gate it and send just that snare drum to the input of the key of a gate on the, on the uh, it's a Jay Giles thing, like freeze, the song Freeze Frame, you know, that, that snare sum is, ver is very uh, obvious in it. And what we did was we shoot the mic, uh, we, we took a, a speaker and put it right outside the mix room was the staircase. Mm -hmm. So I put a JBL there, put a mic down and one up, and we gated it. So every time the snare hit, the, it would, you know, ah, where the gate is, ah, ah, pre non wind pre-AMS. Mm -hmm. So with recording uh, at Blackbird, if I'm recording in that, in that chamber, I'll key the chamber with the, with the, with the snare, the noise gate, and it, it's, it's, it makes a cool sound. But that room in Studio D is a really cool room too, because it's got an API, room, right? An API, yeah, and it's got a chamber in there too. All right. So other than uh, Blackbird, whether you're B so at uh, Sound Emporium Studio B is really cool. right. Um, right. And beside that, I'm. How about Ocean Way A? You like Ocean oh, Way? Oh, it's I mean, great. How right? could you not like Ocean Way A? The only problem with A is that if you're in there doing a project, an album, there's bound to be one or two songs where you don't want a big room sound. Right. And there's no way to tame down a room with just baffles around you. Matter of fact, I've heard about this thing called the drum bella. Have you heard about it? Uh-uh. Yeah, yeah, Eric Valentine, who, by the way, do you know who Eric Valentine is? Yeah. That's preamps that he makes? Forget about it. Uh, the drum bella is a baffle over you. And I remember there was one song I, I cut with Dan with Thomas Rhett where I was at Starstruck. And Starstruck isn't bad. I'm not very comfortable in there. But when I take my stuff out, it sounds good. But I remember putting baffles around the drummer and putting a blanket over um, to get a tight sound. But at Ocean Way, I love the sound of that room. It's, it's big and huge, but yeah. it's hard to get a, a tight sound. But having said that, I, I've done three or four records in there where we did everything, record, overdub, and mix. Oh, wow. Yeah. What um, about places like House of Blues? Right? I'm sorry. I, 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 uh, you know what? I, I yeah, love Gary. I love Gary, but I've had the last few times in there, I've had a few problems, and I'll just leave it at that. I don't like the sound of that room. I, I'm interested in their new room. Sounds looks pretty cool. The yeah. new room that they built that was supposed Across to. Across the street or something? No, no. Or no, the one that's right down the street. Yeah, it's supposed to look like um, an old studio with the. Yeah. With the, what do you call that board stuff inside with the holes in it? You know, that kind of... Pegboard? Pegboard. Pegboard. It's, then, like, it's like Mo to the right of it if you're Motown, looking. Not Motown, but some famous studio, I think, in California or something. But then across the street, there's supposed to be a really small room that's cool. There is the a little... The API from the black it's, truck. It's a little yeah. API. Did you know that? Yeah. But I'm thinking of like rooms like that. What other rooms? Yeah. Like, um, uh, how about that one that does the, the ruckus room? For all the demos. No, I've never been there. 
No, I don't know about that place. There's a couple SSL rooms around. I'm just trying to think of any tracking yeah. rooms that. I'm trying to think too. I mean, so you're I, mostly at Blackbird. I'm mostly at Blackbird or at um, at Reba's place, and huh. I don't mind tracking there. Actually, it sounds pretty decent, and they have enough outboard there. For me, it's just uncomfortable working in there. Right. You know, they number one, they have it's it's a cool console, but the, they have a terracotta floor with tiles this big, so. You, you know, you think, well, what, so what? You know, well, what do you do as an engineer all day? You roll back and forth. You roll forth. back and forth. So, and then if you go to change a piece of outboard, that thing gets stuck and your chair goes out from you. You know, so, but anyway, little things like that. You know, um, Joe, I, I've soured on a few rooms and I'd rather not sure. say all the rooms I like or dislike. How about Omni? Love. I love Omni. Omni. That's a great room. Do you have you, have you ever worked there? The very first, yeah. very first session I ever did. API room down on Demumbrian or Division, very whatever Very affordable. That is. Very very cool. I love mm -hmm. Omni. Yes. Um, what else? Is there anywhere in Nashville you haven't been? Any room you're in Nashville you haven't worked in? Um, well, nowadays probably because yeah. I bet you there's a lot of rooms I've never even heard of. I mean, there's so many rooms popping up. Did you hear about the Sylvia Massey incident on Facebook? Oh, yeah. yeah. So that guy's studio, have you seen that on paper? I've seen some video. It looks incredible. Yeah. It's like in his garage though, right? Now too. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, I've heard so much more about that situation too, where, you know, it's just ridiculous. But. Yeah, I want to hear after the camera goes <laughs> um, Yeah, and soundstage, their back room is pretty cool. Have you heard about that? The, the back room? Yeah, that's the only one I've ever been in. Okay, that's kind of cool because it's got cement floor. Yeah, you know, I did, as a songwriter, I had a demo session there and it was my only demo that cost 1500 bucks for a single song, oh. which is a lot of money for yeah, a demo. Yeah, yeah. That was uh, but that's my only experience. But it sounded great yeah, in that room. Yeah. And there was. And you know, you ever work at Sony? I love Sony. I love Sony. Mm -hmm. Now I'll tell you two two stories. First of all, at Sony, I did a I, I did Sony Tree is a publishing place, and they have a studio for their writers. Uh, but they also do uh, like Big and Rich did all their stuff there. But it, it's who's the name of the guy that made the, the room? Because the control room sits like is this. The Walter Stork thing? No, no, no. Um, uh, the, the control room sits like this, and the studio is over here, and there's glass on the wall. Um, but it's, it's a decent room. It's a Neve um, VR, VR, right? So one day I went to work there and the dim button wouldn't undim. Oh. And the pro, here, here's the other thing too I want to stress upon you is that as an engineer, you're the engineer. Get a good sound and move on. Don't ponder over something. Like, in other words, you're not there to get, to, 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 to get an award for anything. Get as good of a bass drum sound as you can. And if it's just that much off, like I've made a living out of compromising my sounds because I know that, you know, it's like, oh, I don't like that. Don't they have that other mic? You know, it's like, no, let's make do with it. Let's move on. Yeah. You know, that's, that's I've me. made a living out of compromising so, so my the thing sound. You should get business cards printed up like, I work with John Lennon and I made a, I made a career out of compromising I, my sound. You know what, it's kind of, you know, I, I'm not, you know, belittling myself for saying that, but I know that you know, there's so many times that I'm, I've heard something, oh man, I wish, you know, and everybody was like, no, that sounds fine, Steve, let's, let's go. You know, it's like, because a lot of times when I'm working with session players, it, you do have to get moving, right? But this thing I did at Sony with the dim button on, you know, I was a trooper. I was like, I knew they had to get it done. So I'm not going to bitch and complain because it's not about me. It's about them getting those songs. That's what I learned. Wow. And then the other thing, too, I did was, uh, what was the other thing I was going to talk about where I had a problem? I've got a good question whenever you, okay, if you go forgot. No, go What's the, give us a, either a total funniest or the most humiliating story. Have you ever had somebody snap on you and just rip you, tear you apart, dress you down in a session? Or have you ever done something where you've wiped out in the middle of the floor? Well. I heard someone called you an asshole once. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, you, you know, there, there, there was this engineer at Record Plant who, was, who must have gotten beaten up as an assistant because he was a raving lunatic. He would embarrass whoever was his assistant. He embarrassed all the time. And he got on my last nerve on this one session. I was the assistant, and I had another kid assisting me because it was a big session. And at the end of the session, 
the uh, techs came in, started you know doing the tape machines, doing the room over for the next session, and it was me and him and the other guy, and he was getting on me, and I laid into him. The engineer I'm that close to him i almost hit him and i says you know what nobody likes you around here and that was the case <laughs> and i was humiliated by him during the day but my frustrations came out and it was at that point in my career that was still real brand new it was that point i said to myself you know what i'm never going to treat people that way and that's what i learned from him i learned that's how not point. to treat people and nowadays even cartage guys love me. I treat them. Why are people bad to them? They're going to get your, you might need them to get someone over real quick. You ask any cartage guys in town. I mean, they all love me. And my assistants, when I have an assistant, I'm, you know, sometimes there's a time to be stern and, and you don't have to be mean to them, just stern and point out their, their bad things because you never know in two years, they might hire you to do a record. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I try to be nice to everybody. And as you, you know, as I'm doing this, you see, I'm passionate about talking to you. I love talking to, to people and kids and classes and stuff like that. I don't. I, there's no tricks to what I do. I love sharing it because you know, you know, what are you gonna do? You can't take it with you when you're gone, right? So that's true, man. Well, it's evident that you do it because you love it, which yeah. is like a true yeah. gift. And man, it's like uh, I haven't gotten to do any records with you. But yeah. it's like, well, I, mean, I would love that. to, I would love to. And one other thing too that, I, you know, I, uh, one other thing that you had asked me what was my best, funniest, whatever, you know, we already went through the John Lennon thing and about my mother's song at her funeral. The other thing that happened too in my career is I, I'm very sensitive and I'm very, I'm an Italian, so I hug and I mm -hmm. talk loud and I, and I cry. It's okay for men to cry, you know? And, and I get into my songs. I remember doing one song called Welcome to the Golden Years, and it was about a nursing home, and I had to listen to it over and over and mixing, and it just drained me, drained me. I was doing a record with Rodney, and it was the second, second of his records, and um, it, one of the songs, it was called Many a Long and Lonesome Highway, and the last verse was, was about his dad, who I guess he had a problem with, but he sewed it up before his, his death, and, uh, you know, uh, and on his, you know, and one day my father told, and on his deathbed told me something like that, the lyric was. And during the song, during the tracking of it, he was singing the words and he got choked up and he just cried. He just broke down and those cats played through. And of course, that was the master. Mm. Mm. And as soon as the song was over, I made a beeline for the bathroom and I cried my eyes out. I mean, it really affected me because, you know, it was like, I, I heard the song, I heard the lyrics, you know, I heard the song and, and, and I broke down because I knew, you know, it's, it, it really, really affected me. So there you have it. What that's else? That's awesome. Well, that's the kind of guy I want that's on a, records with me. Because yeah. uh, hopefully, hopefully you're trying to make records that move people. And yes. if, if you're not afraid to be moved, that's a beautiful thing. I just noticed I have to go. My daughter works, uh, she is the producer at WSMV Channel 4 News. Mm. So she has to go in at, at night. And I have her car, so she has to go in. And, uh, well, let's thank. And I have to Steve worry about driving home. You know, you, you're, you're welcome to email me and ask me questions or send me, you know, your mixes if you want me to judge them or something like that. He's got my That's email. Great. I don't know if I do have your email. I have your cell oh, phone. I'll okay, I'll text you, you my email. Yeah, what is yeah. your email? Steve Mark with a K1 at att.net. You're not going to read. I, just wanted, I actually <laughs> want to see if it was humiliating. Like, uh, Assman85 at uh, Hotmail.com. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah you, I met John Lennon at Gmail. Yeah. Like, are you here to stay? I'm, yeah, I'm living here. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. cool. Uh, these guys are all different. You know, it's like yeah. some are songwriters. They're all engineers. Yeah, yes. Some are more towards production. Yeah. Some are songwriters. It's a beautiful yeah. mess and mix of... Yeah, that's great. Really I met cool. a guy on Facebook. He, made, he, he has the same name as an engineer here, and I thought it was the engineer here. And he says, no, no, I just moved yeah. here. Um, Matt McClure. Oh, I know Matt. Okay, the, engin the engineer. I know the Nashville Matt, Matt yeah, McClure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is well, that this, a different guy? This different guy. He, you know, he made friends with him, and I said, oh, yeah, I've never met you. He goes, no, that's not me. This guy was from Kentucky, yeah. and um, he's got a beard down to here. He's got a real low voice, very intense, and he sent me a song, and it was, you know, it was, it was halfway there, and I gave him some input, and he sent it to me again. It was night and day, and it was wow. like, so I've helped him, and I made some cool stuff with him, so I, you know, 
nowadays is almost anybody can do it. And that's what I say only because, you know, there's uh, the garage band and there's presets, you know what I mean? But hopefully you guys, you know, whatever you're learning from Joe and from his guests, you, you'll take it a step further and, and put some effort into it and, you know, record it right the first time. And don't think of anything like, we talk demos. I did demos the other day and I listened to it today and I was like, there's nothing demo about it. Demo is not in right. my vocabulary. It's a misnomer. Every time I, re like I'm not gonna record someone thinking, oh, it's a demo, I don't yeah. have to try as hard. Yeah, I'm gonna give him my demo right kick yeah. drum sound. <laughs> yeah, I, I work for a producer, I work for a producer whose name I won't mention, who has Chris Lord Algae mix everything. And do you know who Chris Lord Algae is? You know, he's got, he's got a pattern of the way he mixes and he uses all his own samples. And I don't blame him. He has, he has a way of doing it. He's very successful. He doesn't want to have to think about it. He doesn't want to have to try, oh, let me try that snare because he knows what it's gonna sound like on the radio and all that. So I worked with this producer and we were, gonna, we were doing tracks. I said, you want to change the snare on this one? He goes, ah, it doesn't matter. The Lord's gonna put whatever he wants on there. And it was like, oh. What, what, what are we doing here? What did, right, right, exactly. <laughs> Why don't we just I, let I him do it? I, I didn't think that was out of my mind. I was like, I'm still going to make it sound as good as I can right here, you know?